Good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Kelly, chair of the Rockport School Committee, and welcome to the Parent Forum on School Reopening During the COVID-19 Pandemic. You know, I often need to point out at regular school committee meetings that there are meetings held in public, not public hearings, in observance of state sunshine laws. And so, while we always give our audience a chance to comment on items on the agenda, it's not a freewheeling discussion. Tonight is different. This is a public forum. This is the first one we've had in quite a while where the school committee is asking you, the public, for comments on the reopening of school in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. There'll be a few rules to allow everyone to speak, which I'll go over in a moment, and some context given on what has happened to date so we can all start with the same information, and then we'll move quickly to your comments, which we assume will be the bulk of the meeting. Here's our context. On July 27th, at our last public meeting, we recapped how from the close of school to that meeting, 29 individuals comprising eight subcommittees and one steering committee had been at work preparing for a decision about school reopening this fall. They covered every aspect of school life and were populated by a range of subject matter experts in education, support services, administration, and transportation, and included members of the Board of Health and parents. A few of the school committee members were in each group, but we couldn't have them in all of them because then that would have been a quorum. Their goal was to respond by July 31st to a request from the Massachusetts Commissioner of Education to determine whether a school district could open under three distinct scenarios, those being fully normal, hybrid, and fully remote, given criteria that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education had established. At our last meeting, we recapped what those preliminary plans looked like, shared that the most likely scenario was hybrid or remote, and indicated that once the testing and preliminary reports were filed, we would move to a final proposal by the superintendent of schools to the school committee by August 10th, which has since moved to August 14th, and that prior to finalizing the presentation, we would be back looking for public comment in a public forum, which you are now at. We also shared the results of two polls we had taken of parents and staff as a pulse check on how people were feeling about the reopening. The general response for those of you who weren't at that meeting from both reflected anxiety about the uncertainty of the current situation. That's the past. The sequence of events for tonight Onward will be, one, a presentation of the revised plan since our last public meeting by the superintendent, and two, comment by the public or any questions or concerns that it has. Tomorrow night, should we not get to everyone's comments, there will be a school committee meeting to allow further comments and a discussion by the committee members on potential amendments to the plan. On Monday, August 17th, will be a school committee meeting to vote on the final plan presented by the superintendent at that time with the goal of submitting it if it's approved to DESE. So I just want to reiterate that there is no approved plan currently because we want to remain true to our word that we wanted public input before we started to move towards that conclusion. It's worth pointing out that over the course of the summer, although there have been explicit guidelines by the governor backed by scientific rationale on how bars, restaurants, and public meetings could operate, there has been no state coordinated effort on establishing what is safe for schools. Nor has there been much from the commissioner of education who had first announced that he would be issuing mandates, then backed off to establishing some minimal criteria and suggesting that this was a local decision. This has meant that every city and town school system has had to navigate the uncertainty of a pandemic that's causing great financial and social pain, buffeted by many passionate opinions held by every stakeholder of the school system. Yesterday, apparently responding to current events and the pressure to lead, the governor suggested every school should go back in some manner and finally released a guideline based primarily on cases per 100,000 in a community but again deferred to local authorities to make the call. We continue, we being the school committee and the rest of the, the committees that have been working on the plan to collaborate with the Board of Health on evaluating announcements of this sort. As we start tonight's meeting, two things are very clear. We will only know what the absolute right answer is in terms of reopening 
in retrospect. A year from now, or maybe two, we'll know if we've been overly cautious or overly optimistic in whatever plan we adopt. And two, no matter what plan we endorse and put in place for the fall, we will not be able to please everyone. That being the case, how does the superintendent choose a course of action and how does the school committee evaluate it in its oversight role? As a school system, our charter is clear. We're responsible for the social, emotional, and intellectual development of students under our care in a safe environment. There are lots of things people want the school system to be or to support, and some things that the school system accidentally supports, but by focusing on our core mission, we stand the best chance of achieving it. Our focus in a pandemic has to be on safety first. That will undoubtedly lead to compromise and less than perfect solutions, but that has to be our priority. The superintendent's use of eight different subcommittees over the course of the summer to evaluate solutions resulted in a unanimous approval of the plan on Monday night to present for public comment. Although one member on sleeping on the results later opted to retract their vote, the premise you're going to hear for the first time tonight and the one that the school committee, the full committee is gonna hear for the first time um, was recommended by a vote of 28 to one. Finally, I'd like to point out that despite what you may hear from other districts and towns and social media postings, there are no villains in the effort that I have seen put into this in Rockport. Everyone who's been attempting to create the best plan for reopening this fall has done so by putting aside other agendas. And they do so in an environment where they too have families, children, health issues, and concerns outside of their work life. Please keep that in mind as you comment, whether here or in social media. Direct your frustration at the COVID-19 virus, not at the people trying to educate your children while keeping them safe. They are with you and they are your neighbors. So now we're gonna to move to the superintendent sharing of the proposed plan. And what I wanna preview for you is after that presentation, the way we're gonna work people commenting is we thought it was very important that we hear from the public first. The school committee itself is not going to comment. So we're gonna let you comment in your own voice. And the way we're gonna work that is um, while Rob is pre presenting, if you're familiar with the chat feature down below, if you send me a text, Michael Kelly saying, I have a question, what we're going to do is take those questions one at a time, go through them, and um, you know, it doesn't have to be a question, it can be a response as well. We'll get your feedback. And what we'd also like to do is start with questions of clarification. So if after hearing Superintendent Lebo's presentation, there's something you didn't quite catch or understand, we'd like to take those questions first because that'll base set for everyone what they've just heard. And then we'll move on to opinions, thoughts, comments, worries, where you can say anything you want. So hopefully that's clear. And what I'd like to now do is turn over to Superintendent Lebo um, the presentation so you can see what it is this committee has come up with. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kelly. I'm gonna screen share now, get the plan up. Hopefully. Host disabled attendees screen sharing, Michael. Well, really? Common? You're a host. You disabled the attendees screen sharing. I'm an attendee now. So I can't screen share. Go ahead and try now. There we go. Thank you for letting me out of my box. Okay, folks, I think it's important for me to actually read the plan to you. And at certain sections, the administrators will chip in on uh, how things are exactly in their schools. So um, we felt that it was important every item in the plan um, would be essential for people to know about. So rather than just make a PowerPoint highlight, uh, we've thought that you should actually have a chance to see this and, and read it along with me. Uh, I think the plan is, because this is a public meeting, obviously, is to then post this tomorrow on our website and through Connect Ed, 
I can send this as a document to all parents so that you have a chance to have your own copy and to read it. So our, our fall reopening plan for 2020. Presented tonight. Uh, it has several sections to it, and this is required by DESE to have these sections. So we have an executive uh, summary. We have a letter from me to the community that if this plan is approved, would then be sent out uh, either as an actual letter or, um, or through Connect Ed. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, that we are required to submit to them three plans, how we would handle everybody coming back in person to start the fall, how we would do it in a hybrid model, and how we would do it in a remote model. And again, that's because the Department of Education, rightly so, knows that it's very likely that we're gonna to have to flow between those models during the school year. And then we are asked to do an out of school time plan. And we're also asked to show how student support and professional learning will occur. There's a section called other, which uh, the school district itself can put in essential information. And then we have a section that's really important that we certify that we have met all the health and safety requirements listed in the DESE guidelines about reopening schools. And that is extensive, including a list produced by teachers associations that is equally extensive, asking some pretty tough questions about individual buildings, especially older buildings. So having said that, Rockport Public Schools final plan is gonna be submitted hopefully the night of the 17th, hopefully before midnight when we get done with our school committee meeting. I, I do wanna thank these individuals here because they gave up large amounts of their summer. Uh, some of these folks were paid and many of them were unpaid. Obviously anyone that isn't associated to school was a volunteer to this committee and anyone that has the name teacher after them is someone who they should have had the entire summer for vacation and maybe they'll get some professional development points for being on the committee, but they received no remuneration to be on that committee. And we tried to cover a full gamut of individuals and to be able to have folks from all different aspects of the school. So thank you to all of you for uh, taking a lot of your time this summer, especially in July, and meeting at 7.15 till 10.30 at night to be able to try to hash out a constantly flowing set of uh, targets, expectations, and recommendations coming from many different directions. So, so the first section is the executive summary. Uh, prior to the end of school in June, Rockport Public Schools formed a 29-member school reopening committee consisting of major stakeholders from the school district and the community. This committee is comprised of educators, administrators, school committee members, parents, and members of the Rockport Board of Health. This group consists of nine subcommittees to consider the myriad of issues surrounding the goal of reopening our schools in the fall. Some of the general topics these committees are working on include school oversight, uh, busing, field trips, sports, scheduling, grading, building modifications, personal protective equipment, nursing and health concerns, technology, maintenance and custodial needs and protocols, food services, parent and staff communication, professional development for staff, training and new protocols for students and families, as well as the social emotional well-being, mental health, and general support for all members of our school community. Many weeks of hard work, multiple meetings, and careful consideration were spent working out the details of a comprehensive plan that would allow for the safe return of as many students as possible to in-person school settings to maximize learning and address our students' holistic needs. There is ongoing uncertainty regarding the nature and trajectory of the COVID-19 virus in our region. And we are approaching the end of the busy summer months with a recent uptick in the number of confirmed cases in Massachusetts. Many rightful concerns have been expressed by both staff and parents in dealing with the safe return of children to our school buildings. Also in the midst of an uncertain, confusing, and highly charged political atmosphere on both the local and national front with divergent opinions at all levels, this has been a very trying exercise in which we have utilized all available research, guidance, and available expertise in forming our plans and developing our recommendation. 
with our overriding goal of making a recommendation on reopening our schools in a way that is both educationally sound and equitable for all students, and most importantly safe for all members of the school, school community, it is the recommendation of the superintendent of schools and the Rockport Public Schools Reopening Committee that we begin the new school year with a phased in approach to reopening that begins in an enhanced fully remote learning model. School will start for staff only on Monday, August 31st, with 10 professional development days used to focus on refining our remote and hybrid learning models, as well as for training the entire staff in the implementation of our new health and safety protocols. For students, the school year will begin on Wednesday, September 16th. As part of Rockport's prudent and phased in approach, we are adding reevaluation checkpoints throughout the school year to be able to shift into a hybrid and or full in-person learning model as soon as it is feasible and safe for all. The first reevaluation checkpoint will be scheduled for Wednesday, October 14th. After the reopening committee reviews the progress made in regards to the Rockport Public School safety measures and metrics, which were just issued by state officials Tuesday at noontime, surrounding the state of the virus, as well as the safety of the buildings for students and staff, a decision will then be made whether to remain in our full remote model or to, tr to transition to our hybrid learning model. Our second reevaluation checkpoint will be set for Wednesday, November 25th. If subsequent checkpoints are needed, those dates will be determined and announced at that time. Um, this is the letter to the community. Uh, it basically states the same kind of things that are in that um, opening statement, but I, I think it's probably worth reading it out. Uh, dear Rockport Public School families, I hope that you've had some time to enjoy your summers during this unprecedented and stressful circumstances. I'd like to thank all of you for your support, encouragement, and collaborative efforts during our spring remote learning experience. Your efforts went above and beyond the call of duty to support your children and also our staff in a difficult situation in order to, to, to promote the best learning experience possible without any time to plan for it. We know there were several challenges this past spring, and we are committed to addressing and improving upon those as we move forward into the unpredictable fall and winter seasons that lie ahead. Many members of the Rockport Public Schools administration and staff, the Rockport School Committee, and the Rockport community have worked diligently to develop ways to address the health and safety concerns presented to us as we try to develop the best plan to reopen our schools in the fall. The number of challenges to overcome in order to protect every member of our school community while also providing an equitable and rich learning experience for all are staggering. Our reopening plans address three educational delivery models as directed by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE. These models include a full in-person learning model, a hybrid learning model, and a remote learning model. At this time, based on our reopening committee's review of the Center for Disease Control, CDC guidelines, a full in-person to school was returned to school was not possible as we are unable to bring all students back and maintain the recommended six feet of social distance between them in our buildings and classrooms. After making this determination, we spent countless, countless hours working through both hybrid models and schedules, as well as on improving our previously utilized remote learning model to make it more robust and engaging. We have been met with many roadblocks to implementing our hybrid learning model at this time. They include transportation needs, potential concerns around our ventilation and HVAC systems, our ability to implement our full program of studies and our music and theater programs, and our staff and students who are COVID-19 high risk categories and or have pre-existing medical conditions that would make returning to school in person dangerous for them and their families. It is therefore with regret that we have decided to return to school in the fall through a phased in approach that will begin with our remote learning model. We will continue to work on our remote and hybrid plans, develop ways in which we can adequately address the needs of our high needs and high risk students and make continuing improvements to all of our learning models. Students will return to school remotely on Wednesday, the September 16th. 
This follows 10 days where our staff will be taking part in much needed training and professional development in remote and hybrid learning and health and safety protocols. We have set the dates of October 14th and November 25th as reevaluation deadlines to attempt a safe transition into a hybrid model. We will continue to keep you updated throughout this process as we move forward. Thank you again for supporting our schools and our staff during this difficult time in education and in the world we share. We hope to work together with you to support our families, students, and staff in making each phase of this pro process better than the last. So the required mass DESE opening of school models. Massachusetts DESE has required all school districts in the state to submit three potential school opening models by October, by, excuse me, August 17th for review and approval by the department. It is the expectation of DESE that each district will be able to pivot between the models as appropriate and necessary in a seamless manner throughout the upcoming school year in response to the health and safety circumstances that present themselves at the time. So the returning without restrictions is the ideal, but that's not going to happen. In-person learning with new safety requirements, the hybrid, and then remote learning. So the in-person learning model. The safety and well being of our students and staff attending and working within the Rockport Public School buildings is of paramount importance and cannot be compromised. In addition, it is also vitally important that our school reopening plan take into consideration the demographics of the greater Rockport community and the potential that reopening schools in a fully operational mode may have in increasing the risk of a spread of the COVID-19 virus to any of our high-risk citizens. In considering the possibilities of a full in-person reopening in September, we conducted the DESE recommended pressure testing of our facilities. After consulting with the Rockport Board of Health and the CDC guidelines, the reopening committee determined that three feet of social distancing was not adequate to provide safety in our schools. And we decided it was necessary to use a minimum of six feet. With this in mind, the pressure testing showed it was not possible to maintain six feet of social distancing given our, given our space constraints. Because of this, opening school fully in person in this fall will not be possible at the Rockport Public Schools. We will continue to review all areas of the safety guidance at each of our reevaluation dates in order to return to full in-person learning as soon as possible. We do hope that once a suitable vaccine is readily available and widely administered in the community, all districts will be able to return all of our students to in-person learning. The hybrid learning model. Note, in a hybrid, students alternate in between in-person learning with safety requirements and remote learning. In considering the possibility of implementing a hybrid model for reopening the Rockport Public Schools in September, we reviewed all DESE guidance on masks and face coverings, physical distancing, student cohorts, screenings, isolation, testing in the schools, and PPE supplies. We developed schedules for hybrid models in order to maximize student in-person learning while also trying to, uh, to minimize exposure risks. Although many of our parents were willing to switch their transportation to driving their students to school for this year, the busing guidance would require us to add an additional bus. Due to the age of our buildings and the age of our ventilation and HVAC systems, air quality and air circulation are a major concern for staff and families. As we have yet to have our system evaluation completed, we feel that starting hybrid would not be prudent at this time. We need more time for the evaluation of the system, review of the reports, and purchasing and repairing any of the identified deficiencies. In terms of curricular planning, since we are such a small district, it is already hard to address the needs of programming when we offer AP, honors, and career and college preparatory courses. We do not want to limit these opportunities as we hope circumstances do allow for us to come back to in-person learning soon. At this time, the hybrid models make it more challenging to allow for the coverage in all areas while also holding students accountable. In addition, Rockport is a visual and performing arts centered school district and community. With the guidance not allowing the following courses and activities to take place indoors, chorus, singing, 
musical theater, and brass and woodwind, woodwind instruments. Our schedules are significantly impacted are these are, as these are scheduled into all three of our buildings throughout each day in all of our learning models utilizing shared staff. The ability to have coverage for the students throughout the day limits our ability to make our hybrid schedules meaningful and engaging for all learners. Also, several staff members and parents have expressed concerns about their own high-risk factors for COVID-19, as well as their pre-existing medical conditions. While these factors limit their ability to return to in-person teaching and learning, they still afford them the opportunity to work and learn remotely. Given all of the above reasons and the current climate in our school community, we are not recommending opening school with our hybrid learning model. We will reevaluate this decision October 14th and, and November 25th, and we hope to enter into a hybrid learning model after having more time to work on the models, train students and staff, and follow the health metrics in our community and state. Hybrid model details. In our hybrid model, students would attend school two days per week in person, and they would learn remotely two days per week. One additional day, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will be fully remote. Each in-person day will run a full schedule for students. On remote days, students will have a mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning. All students will receive instruction remotely on Mondays. Cohort A will attend on Tuesdays and Thursdays for in-person learning and remotely on Wednesdays and Fridays. Cohort B will attend in-person Wednesdays and Fridays and remotely on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The building will be cleaned nightly. At all levels, schools will work closely with families to determine support for high needs students, whether they take the option to come each day or whether they make a family decision to remain completely remote. Administrators will also strive to have students from the same family attend on the same day, but this may not be possible in all situations. And then we have individual schedules and I would turn things over to each principal. We'll, we'll start with the elementary school principal, Todd Simendinger, who will talk about uh, how the elementary hybrid model is structured. Todd? Thank you, Rob. So two points um, prior to this, the hybrid model that I think are important that aren't included in here. Um, one is, is that in both models, um, we do anticipate having the, the four school music program either remotely or definitely remotely if we were in the remote, but um, uh, depending on the guidance in the hybrid model um, outside or in some, some capacity. Um, the other point is that they, we're currently working with um, the Y who is offering some potential options for childcare options that are under consideration and, and will be presented tomorrow night at school committee. The elementary school hybrid plan, um, as Rob mentioned, is Monday remote and then day on, day off um, with remote learning and in-person learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the, the hybrid days or the, I'm sorry, the remote days are, are going to be built around um, as extensions of in-person learning days. Um, so the work that's going to be expected to be completed at the elementary level will be an extension of the work that's being taught directly in the classroom with um, opportunities for students to engage in that work independently, but there will also be uh, times that will be assigned um, or, or available for students to be able to access staff during the day if they have questions about the work that they're being asked to complete. Um, and I think that's about all in terms of the general summary. Uh, this might be important. We are working out the details of that students identified as high needs will have the opportunity to attend additional in-person days beyond those just assigned to their cohort. So we realize there are groups of, of kids, especially uh, uh, students with special needs, uh, English language learners, um, other kids with uh, specific situations that made last spring extremely difficult and that we are doing everything we can to make sure that those kids 
are live with their teachers as much as possible. There, there are some more details to work out on that, but I, th I feel confident that we will work that out uh, with our staff so that those kids are not gonna be left behind uh, at all as they had a situation unfortunately thrust upon them last spring that caused issues with that. Uh, we now go to Rockport Middle School and uh, actually we have a dual administrative situation. Amanda LaMancia is uh, going to give birth to her first child here in just a few weeks and she will be taking uh, most of the year off to rightfully uh, raise her new most precious resource. And Heather Castingway is coming over from the elementary school where she has been the assistant uh, principal and, and curriculum director to take on that role for us. And I'll actually be helping Todd out a little bit in terms of evaluation and that sort of thing over at the elementary school. So one of them is going to do the hybrid model and one of them is going to do the remote and I'll just wait for the first voice to appear and I'll know who's doing which one. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm going to talk about the hybrid. Um, so in the same pattern that Spod Todd spoke about for um, elementary, we would have our remote learning day on the Monday. Cohort A would come Tuesday and Thursday and cohort B Wednesday and Friday. Um, so the schedule in the plan is a sample sixth grade schedule, um, just with the times of the different periods, um, as well as where we would try to incorporate some mask breaks for the students in the building. Um, they would, you know, we would try to, we would keep to a rotating core schedule. Some of you who have had middle schoolers would be familiar with, you know, sometimes it's A, B, C, D, the next day it might be C, D, B, A, just, so students can have different classes at different times. Um, but for purposes of just clarity in here, it's just listed at the period times. Um, on, so on Wednesday, for example, when cohort A is in a remote model, they would be looking at a mix of um, scheduled blocks where they can check in with teachers, and then a mix of times where they would be working more independently on really structured uh, lessons that had come out of the day before. Um, so similar to, again, what Todd was saying, where your in-person learning is going to really set kids off for the next day so that they can continue on that work and learning um, when they are not in the building and get help where needed. Thank you very much, Amanda. Yeah. We would now move on to Rockport High School and Amy Rose. Thank you. Uh, so at the high school level, um, we are working together to create a schedule where we could keep the integrity of the program, whether we're in full, remote, or, um, or fully back in school or hybrid, any of the three models. Um, so in doing that, we really had to, we had kind of gone back and forth about toying with different cohorts um, by grouping which is really difficult to do at the high school level given the AP programming and honors level courses and electives which are spanned across grade levels nine through 12. Um, so what we did was we, we actually have two models out there. This is an example of one. We are still in the midst of working with building based committees and getting feedback from staff. So this would may change slightly, but if people were planning, um, you know, Monday would be the remote day which we actually are hoping to tweak a little bit to really provide students the opportunity to understand what the expectations are for the week. So they would get um, information weekly on Mondays in person, you know, in person via Zoom. It's not really in person, but face to face with exactly the objectives for the week, the schedules for the week, um, so that they would have a clear understanding of their learning expectations. Tuesday, Thursday would be a cohort of kids from Wednesday, Friday. We built in some um, potentially still pending, obviously approval and, and depending on if this is the model we go with, um, some potential late starts on Thursday and Friday to allow for some team time and department time at the high school level that is not built into the day. And we really do believe that if we are gonna be able to work together as a team and provide consistent message for students and families across seven different teachers, we're gonna need to build in that time so that um, we can really create systems that will support you in supporting your children. 
Um, you'll see that we, we did longer chunks of time, 75 minute chunks, because when they're in person, we really want that time to be spent engaged in learning, not necessarily lecture, but in actual activities. And we tried to decrease the transition times rather than having eight transition times throughout the day, having less because that is going to be the biggest challenge at the high school level, given that um, all kids in the building have to transition at the same time because we don't have grade level cohorts. Um, so this is a sample model there. It is up for discussion. There's another model out there I'm working with staff on now. And um, I'm hoping to offer a high school specific, um, and which I think most most of the building based principals would would put out, you know, building specific things closer to opening so that we can assist families in understanding the, the models at a higher level, better level. That's it. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Uh, we move on to the remote learning model. Uh, the Rockford Public Schools will be reopening for the 2020-2021 school year in our remote learning model. Our staff will start school on August 31st with the benefit of the state provided 10 additional professional development days. Our students will return on September 16th, immediately following the staff days. We have reviewed and revised the remote schedules we provided in the spring, and we have incorporated the feedback that we received from staff and families that was gathered, gathered through surveys. With the addition of staff training, as well as the incorporation of accountability measures in place for attendance and grading, our remote model will be more robust and engaging. We will reevaluate our safety measures and public health measures in an ongoing process and will look at October 14th and November 25th as dates to potentially move from a remote learning model into our hybrid learning model. The Rockport Public Schools remote model at each level will allow all students to engage in meaningful learning activities. Schedules are designed to meet DESE requirements for DESE time on learning. At all levels, the district will be meeting DESE requirements for the following. One, procedures for all students to participate in remote learning, including a system of tracking for attendance and participation. Rockport Public Schools will be utilizing our new Aspen Student Information System to track attendance, participation and grading for accountability purposes. Two, alignment of remote academic work to state standards. The remote learning schedules at all levels preserve common planning time, department time, and other dedicated time for professional learning communities, PLCs. Through collaboration with one another, teachers will be planning lessons that are aligned to state standards in the same way they would in in-person learning. Additionally, additionally, we will be building in professional development within the first 10 days of school, in addition to our regularly scheduled professional days throughout the year to support the transition to an online, online format. Lessons are expected to have clear learning objectives linked to state standards. Three, a policy for issuing grades for students' remote academic work. At all three schools, students will continue to receive grades and or feedback depending on their grade level. The days of credit, no credit, which was a situation in the spring, are behind us. At RES, students receive standard-based report cards on a semester basis, providing parents with an understanding of how students are progressing on each standard. These re reports will be utilized in remote learning as well. At Rockport Middle School and Rockport High School, Students receive feedback on assignments and letter grades. In remote learning, students will be graded as they would be during in-person learning. All three schools will utilize Aspen to track grades. Both Rockport Middle School and Rockport High School will operate on four quarters, likely to be modified given the first days of the 10 days of the school will be for professional development. Number four, a method for teachers and administrators to regularly communicate with students parents and guardians, including providing interpretation and translation services to limited English proficient parents and guardians. Each building has communication procedures in place for regular family outreach. The procedures may be slightly different depending on building resources and staffing. Overall, as a district, each school will use the website, Blackboard, Aspen, Google Classroom, Seesaw, and social media in varied capacities for communication around work and school updates. 
Additionally, at RES, primary communication will begin with the classroom teacher. As concerns come up, additional resources, such as counseling staff and administration, will be brought in to discuss and implement outreach plans. At Rockport Middle School, will we'll be divided into advisory groups so that each teacher has approximately 10 students to check in with weekly and act as an initial point of contact for families. These teachers will work in collaboration with grade level teams, counseling staff, dean, and administration to address higher needs and increased communication. At Rockport High School, classroom teachers will outreach when appropriate, and the dean of students and counseling staff Will be, the second, <laughs> will be the second level of communication for students and families that, that need additional support. <coughs> All schools have utilized translation services through MAPA or a hired <coughs> translator when appropriate, and they will continue to do so in remote learning. Five, districts should also include information about the technology platforms, staffing model curriculum, and instructional materials they will employ. In the spring of 2020, the Rockport Public Schools technology team worked diligently to get Chromebooks or iPads to all families who needed technology for remote learning. Hotspots were also deployed to families that indicated their internet connection was not adequate. Additionally, software was purchased to provide mandated content filtering for district-owned devices, which will be expanded this fall. The technology department has continued to plan for families needing to utilize district technology in order to access learning remotely. These will again be primarily Chromebooks for grades three through 12 and iPads for grades pre-K through two. The technology department has budgeted to increase technology and has applied for additional grants to increase our supply of hardware and software. The district is purchasing a subscription to Zoom and we will continue to use Zoom and other video conferencing tools to support remote learning in the best way possible. Other resources to be utilized include G Suite, Google Classroom, Seesaw, Galileo, BrainPop, et cetera. Each school will deploy its typical staffing model. At Rockport Elementary School, teachers work in grade level teams with paraprofessional and special education support at each level. Rockport Middle School also works in grade level teams with dedicated special education teachers and paraprofessionals in place. Rockport High School teachers will continue to carry a full teaching load with a mix of college prep preparatory, honors, and AP courses. Classes with IEP needs will be staffed with paraprofessionals and special education teachers as required per IEPs. Teachers will employ the same curriculum as they do during in-person learning, making accessibility modifications as needed as they transition to an online format. All schools continue to modify schedules based on parents choosing to keep their students home to take part in fully remote learning. Staff with medically documented reasons to work from home, best instructional practices, and reevaluation as we move forward, as well as ever-changing COVID data through consultation with the Rockport Board of Health. So now we would go through the uh, individual schools. So I would turn things uh, back over. Rob, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've been getting um, questions while you've been presenting. One of them had to do with the bullets under the hybrid and remote model for elementary. Apparently those weren't read and, and some people missed what their content was. So I don't know if this is a good time to just quickly go back and touch on those bullets before you go to the next uh, section. Back to the, the the first model back to the hybrid? Right, the hybrid and remote apparently had bullets under. Um, let, me, let me find out. Uh, yeah. so, uh, right, right there we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, Todd, you wanna go through those? Yeah, I mean, those were, <clears throat> excuse me, largely what I talked about minus the, um, the, the the points on the right about the in school um, and, and the in school instruction and what that would look like in, in terms of um, students re would be remaining inside their um, their cohorts their classroom cohorts for the course of the entire day, um, including during lunch and recess um, and I think that's about all that I missed in that. 
you want to move on, Michael? Or uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure, I didn't chop something off. Okay, so we were right here, which is Todd. You were about to pick up with the remote model yep. for the elementary school. Yeah, do you want to scroll down to the schedule? Yep. Want me to read that? Why don't I just read that out loud, then I'll hand you the schedule. Okay. Uh, the RAS remote model will, it will incorporate a combination of live instruction, pre recorded lessons, community and skill building activities, and individual and group consults with staff in all content areas for four hours each day times five days per week. Remote content instruction and activities will be supported through a variety of technology platforms, including Seesaw, Savas, Realize Online Math, Mystery Science, Brain Pop, Pear Deck, Epic, and Tumble Books. Remote learning attendance and accountability will be tracked using a combination of attendance during live instruction, accessing and viewing of pre-recorded lessons, and completion and submission of daily assignments. The scope and sequence in core instructional areas will be modified to address priority standards with approximately 80% of instructional time dedicated to ELA and math instruction. Tiered protocols will be utilized to address, address student attendance concerns with parents, including teacher outreach, counselor outreach, and administrative outreach when necessary. Remote classrooms will be staffed by grade level teachers with additional layers of support woven in using special education teachers, specialists, and teacher assistants based on the individual needs and development level of each classroom. Special education and other related services will be delivered either remotely or where appropriate and if possible through in-person instruction. Report cards will reflect the modified core standards and skills daily parent communication specific to schedule, learning expectation, office hours, and assignments will be communicated with parents using a school-wide template delivered either daily or weekly through Seesaw. And now the schedule talk. Okay. So the, the big difference from the spring with the elementary remote plan is, is that uh, it's considerably longer because we are now required to um, adhere to the state requirement for time on learning. Um, and because we, we feel like we're able to expand it successfully. Um, a couple of things that are different, um, the circumstances this time around are a little bit different in, a, that in the sense that um, there will be a fair number of students we expect that will not be able to access live instruction uh, in real time, um, and that was a concern for us. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in the schedule um, is um, asking teachers to um, pre-record their lessons or record them as they're instructing them and put them on a grade level template, um, which will go on the school website, which will outline daily assignments and expectations, links to videos, resources, those sort of things. Um, as you'll see as Rob's scrolling through there, he's going, at the, the, the four, the first four days are um, exactly the same in remote. Um, the, the afternoon schedules um, are built to provide some flexibility. So the one o'clock on time is, um, or the 12.15 on time is basically an opportunity for students to engage in a combination of independent work, small group instruction. Um, specialists are looking at offering um, um, choice specials um, in the afternoons. Um, students still will, will be getting a roughly 30 minutes special during their normal remote block. But these will be opportunities for students to engage uh, even beyond that if they choose to do that. Uh, also opportunity for um, special education service delivery. Um, another important point on this too is that um, we know from our parent feedback that one of the concerns was the screen time. Um, so we're really gonna be looking towards providing other options for completing work. Um, paper-based options for completing work for, for, for students who prefer that or parents who prefer that um, in, in order to make it more accessible and a little less demanding in terms of the screen time. Um, we also are working on um, looking at how we can effectively bridge the gap uh, of communication with parents in terms of progress 
um, and we will have more information on that um, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think the big thing too for us in this is that the bottom line is for at the elementary level especially is figuring out creative ways that we can build connections um, and classroom community, manage and handle the social emotional supports and some of that's going to be sort of figuring it out on the go and figuring out how we can do that creatively but it, it absolutely it has to be a priority for our kids um, because for many of them the community piece and the social piece is why they're invested I can ex I experience that with my own children at home in remote learning um, and so we're going to be working really hard at finding creative ways to be able to do that as well so I want to talk about the Friday schedule, Todd, or is that yeah. so explanatory? The, the Friday schedule is the same with the exception of the fact that the, the afternoon slot is designated as a, um, uh, an, a PLC time for staff. So there will be no expectations for student work um, being completed in the afternoons. Okay, we would move on to the middle school and I believe that Heather Castingway is going to present this schedule, Heather. Thanks, Rob. Um, so the middle school schedule would hold all of the seven classes per day. Um, it mirrors very similarly to an in-person schedule except remotely. Uh, we would make sure that each um, student was in attendance for all of their classes on each day and we would um, provide breaks and lunch for them as well. Uh, what's really important to notice um, that we decided was very important from, as a change from the spring was adding in an advisory block. Um, the advisory blocks, uh, as Rob mentioned earlier, uh, would be students being assigned to a specific point person um, where families could have communications with um, the school and the student would also have a relationship with that specific adult. Um, that would increase uh, engagement of knowing assignments, a point person with any questions that you had, and we want to make sure that that supports families um, in a more supportive way than, than in, we had in the spring. Um, one of the other areas that we wanted to just point out is that we, just like the elementary school, we're going to be doing um, some planning around how much screen time students have. Um, we're meeting team by team, making those decisions to try to make more of the work um, asynchronous as well as having scheduled times for students to do some work. So. Um, I feel like this, this time around, we're really making sure that that connection to home and supporting families is key to our communication. So that covers most of um, any questions that families have. I think that covers everything. Uh, and I don't know if you want to mention the, the, the last little piece or about the checkout. Oh, so yeah, at the end of the day, we, we do a checkout with students to make sure that they um, have the uh, all the assignments that they need to work on going forward, any questions they have, and any supports that um, that students themselves need. So it's, it's a nice way for them to check back in with teachers and uh, making sure they know and understand what's going on. Questions about technology, about formatting, um, any anything that pops up. Um, for concerns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, move on to the high school, Amy. Okay, so the high school schedule, as I um, said about the remote model, we're trying, I mean the hybrid model, I'm trying to keep them consistent um, so that we can ebb and flow back and forth between models. So we will be keeping with the A through G format that allows us to keep um, the AP honors and college prep courses as scheduled. Um, we, did, we did understand last spring that having seven different teachers and seven different methods for communication that our students were really overwhelmed by the amount of different emails and expectations. So part of our plan for opening would be to put these common expectations on to teachers and give them the resources that they need to really be able to communicate effectively and in, in, in a similar matter across every um, subject area. So because of that, 
we will be building in on Tuesdays and Thursdays some time for um, in the afternoons there, Rob, yeah, time for teachers to collaborate both as departments and as teams. It also gives teachers a chance to check in with support staff, such as our Dean of Students and counseling staff to really um, keep the pulse on students and who's, who's um, engaging, who's struggling, so that we can really assist families and get the resources in as quickly as possible. We did wanna keep the U Block and advisory times in place, specifically for things like music and art, since we do hold classes during U Block. And as the middle and elementary school said, um, having that advisory time and keeping that connection with students is extremely important. Um, so we will be honoring and valuing that while also trying to keep in mind that the screen time is going to get, I think in you know, my personal opinion, it's going to be a, too much all around. Um, I think we all think that. So we really wanna make sure that we're coming up with systems to support the kids so that they know what to expect on any given day and that the ex expectation is not always to be on Zoom from 7.35 to 2.10, that we build in opportunities for enrichment, hands-on projects, and being outdoors. So we'll have to collectively look at that as a staff, and that's um, built into our planning stages over the next few weeks. Uh, thank you, Amy. Yep. Uh, out of school time plan. In this section, please include any information about additional supports, instruction, or services the district will provide to students before and after school through 21st century learning if applicable and on the weekends. At this time, we are still considering the issues surrounding running before or after school programs in our remote or hybrid model. Athletics will be determined by the school committee and the superintendent based on guidance from DESE and the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, MIAA, that will be issued shortly. They're saying um, this week or next week, they would have some guidance about sports. Student supports and professional learning. Please include the following information in this section, safety, wellness, and social emotional supports, planning and instruction, assessment, intervention, a school calendar with start date and PD, PD days prior to reopening as recommended. Rockwork Public Schools is considering several options for student supports to supplement both our hybrid and remote learning models. In our hybrid model, all students will be trained in health and safety protocols in their opening days during their initial live in-person sessions. In our remote model, individual and small groups of high needs and or high risk students will have the opportunity to meet with service providers in person. In their initial meetings, administrators, deans, counselors, and or special educators will be available to train all in-person students in health and safety procedures and protocols. Our counselors, guidance counselors, psychologists, and health teachers are currently working with administrators to develop diverse and developmentally appropriate wellness and social emotional supports and lessons. These will be made available to all students in both the remote and hybrid models. In the remote model, high needs and high risk students will once again be offered these supports in live, in person, one on one, or in small group meetings with the appropriate identified staff. Planning and instruction at Rockport Public Schools will continue in an ongoing manner throughout the summer. Professional development needs have been identified in 25 different areas. Subcommittees are drafting proposals for each of these areas in order to embed training, planning, and learning into the first 10 days of school and throughout the year through meetings, specific professional development sessions, and or any specific training areas that will be continually identified and implemented. Our 10 days of professional staff development will include navigating our new schedules, teacher expectations in our new schedules, PPE and COVID-19 information procedures and protocols, nurse training, bus safety, drop off and pickup procedures, recess and lunch protocols, Google Suites, Zoom, SEL, our SIS system, Aspen, Screencastify, ma mandatory trainings from DESE, EpiPen training, grading and accountability, classroom setup and lesson planning, supporting at-risk students, support for paraprofessionals, staff self-care, curriculum coverage and changes, reader's workshop, maintenance and custodial training, our new website, Pear Deck, 
substitute training, parent communication, district collaboration, and special education eligibility determinations. Assessments in the area of special education evaluations will be conducted in both hybrid and remote models. Um, Martha, you want to pick up at this point on this section? Sure thing. Thanks, Rob. Um, so as you may be well aware, um, we did um, have to halt um, the kind of comprehensive opportunities that we have in place for students to have uh, initial evaluations and reevaluations conducted in the spring. It was uh, virtually impossible to have face-to-face -face opportunities um, to be able to assess students. Uh, parents, I want to thank you publicly for all the support you provided to our department to be able to uh, work with us to update IEPs in a way that was meaningful for students in the situation that we had. Um, but we do have an obligation to move forward as many as possible um, upon the opening of school on September 16th to uh, re kind of um, start those timelines and to get students evaluated. Um, so uh, in both the hybrid and the remote models, we'll be making efforts um, within the first uh, 10 days. Team chair people and liaisons will be reaching out to families to um, talk about those timelines and how those might happen, whether their students coming in um, off of their uh, hybrid days or off of their remote days, um, how we'll, we'll get that all scheduled and we'll get it tucked away so that kids have that opportunity. Um, and we'll follow up with the meetings and as close to the timeline as we can. So there's more information to follow with that from Desi about uh, some of the guidelines around that, but we will be moving forward in as timely manner as possible. Um, overall, the assessment um, for all students um, in terms of just progress monitoring and student accountability in the content areas will be reviewed on an ongoing basis in all buildings. Um, and we'll need to maintain momentum in the curriculum delivery and avoiding the increase in anxiety for staff and students um, to collect meaningful and accurate data so um, we can move forward as effectively as possible in both hybrid and remote models. Um, interventions will be built into the schedules based on the identified needs and content, social emotional well being, and the high risk student concerns. Um, these will be made available to all students in both remote and hybrid models. The remote model, um, high needs and high risk students will once again be offered these supports um, in person, one to one, and in small groups um, with the appropriate identified staff. Advisory groups for all students are being developed for inclusion on both models as well. So our calendar, uh, we would start again August 31st with the 10 front-loaded uh, professional development days. Uh, contractually, uh, the Friday before Labor Day weekend is a day where uh, staff and students would not report. So that's a contractual day. Uh, there's Labor Day, and there's the first student day in remote. Um, the rest of the calendar flows as it was originally planned in terms of its days. Uh, it would have a last student day on June 16th, which is a Tuesday. And again, we would anticipate no snow days pushing that out. And... Um, it's a 170 day instructional calendar instead of a 180 day instructional calendar. So that calendar was actually approved at our last school committee meeting. So it has the front loaded PD, student start, and then a student end that is at a reasonable position in the, in the school year without any likelihood to be pushed into that uh, one to fourth week of June. Other information and H in this section to be determined by the context of the district. We are currently working with the Rockport Teachers Association, the RTA, as well as the Rockport Educational Support Staff Association to develop ways to include testing and evaluations and in-person instruction of DESE identified high need students within the remote model. I turn things back over to Martha to talk about SPED services and the integrated preschool. Sure. Um, thanks, Rob. So the district is going to continue to establish and coordinate schedules around special education supports and services um, to all students who receive services through an IEP to assure a FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education. Um, if we go back to um, the guidance that was issued by DESE in the late spring, um, in regards to opening for the fall of 2020, they state very specifically that students must receive all services documented in their IEPs through in-person instruction, remote instruction, or a combination of both with a strong emphasis on providing in-person instruction to the greatest extent possible 
while abiding by the current necessary health and safety requirements. Um, DESI identifies two populations which are most at risk. That's preschool age children and students with significant and complex needs. And then DESI further gives us, um, provides some guidance um, that identifies students who may be considered as having significant and complex needs as those students who are already identified as high needs through the IEP process. Um, it's kind of a technical thing. It's students who receive 75% or more of their time receiving special education services, whether in a general education setting or in a pullout setting. Um, students who um, demonstrate that they cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability related needs. Students who primarily use aided or augmentative communication. Um, students who are homeless, students who are in foster care or congregate care, and students who may be duly identified as English language learners and students with learning disabilities. I guess I, I want to just kind of um, add in, this is a little bit of a different of a guideline um, for those of you who have students who receive services um, through an IEP, students with um, special needs. Um, in the spring, we focused on something called remote learning plans, and it was really aligned with about the 50% amount of time that students were receiving um, educational opportunity through general education means. The individual learning service plans that were put in place aligned with about 50% of time um, that equated to the time on a student's IEP. Um, the guidance now is for us to work with families um, in a very close way in the probably opening you know, 10 days of school to talk about how all the minutes of a student's IEP will be met. Um, because we're entering in a remote, in a phased in um, approach, there is gonna be a change. They're not gonna all be you know, um, in person minutes or maybe one to one as they would have been, but um, liaisons will be uh, working through a protocol that is in the process of being developed of how to um, have individual conversations with families um, as we move through those first 10 days of PD to develop service plans that make sense for students moving forward. And um, as parents, um, you're a key stakeholder, so we need to get some feedback from you all about how things went last spring, specifically to your child, and how we have to partner to make things more um, appropriate and to, and to meet those needs as we move forward as best as possible. Um, so again, just in consultation with parents, individual service plans will be documented for students. Um, if you could just scroll down a little bit, Rob, that'd be great. Um, as we talk about the integrated preschool, um, Todd and I, Todd is the uh, principal of the elementary school and he, he and I partner um, in, in terms of um, how the integrated preschool uh, functions. Um, at this time, we know that students who are identified as eligible at the age of three for, for special education are considered by the state the most highest need students. Uh, we do have um, in the integrated program, we now have limitations on the amount of spaces that we can have students. So where previously we might have had 15 spots available for a comb combined classroom population, we're looking at something closer to 10. Um, so we need to prioritize right now on making sure we're meeting the minutes and time on for our students with special needs. Uh, we're working on um, developing how to screen the students, uh, community peers for the integrated spots that we weren't able to screen in the, in the spring. So those are things that are in process right now. Um, and hopefully we can have you know, by this time next week, some more information about specifics around those things. Um, when we're looking at related services, um, so um, uh, speech, OT, PT, counseling, applied behavior analysis, those will be continued to be provided to students in all instructional models, um, whether we're remote, hybrid, or fully in person. Um, they may include in-class supports, breakout sessions, telehealth and remote instruction, asynchronous practice, um, and consultation. Uh, mental health providers will conduct outreach um, efforts to identify those students and families who are demonstrating a real timely need for support and their work will focus on students and families establishing healthy and re realistic routines to support re-entry into the school um, in the fall and also um, they are, they are, our counseling staff is fantastic in supporting families um, in helping them connect with community-based services that might need outside of educational content that will certainly continue. Um, as we look to the IEP um, evaluations, I spoke a little bit about that already. Um, we will be working to coordinate how to get those um, conducted for students in person um, relative to the timelines that may have been paused last spring. So there will be you know, an order and we'll work with families to establish when students can come on site. Um, and we're, as we talk about having IEP meetings, whether they're check-in meetings or annual reviews or evaluations, um, last year, because we were um, in the spring still under order of school closure, those were mandated to be remotely. Um, we, are not we are not under a mandated 
school closure anymore. So parents now have the right to say, if you want to come in for a meeting, um, you certainly can. Um, it will look potentially different because of the space constraints in all of our buildings. To have a team meeting with five or six or seven uh, team members would be virtually impossible. So we're going to have to talk about what that will look like. But any family who wants to continue to have IEP meetings remotely, we will continue to um, be able to do that. Uh, and I think as a, as a district, um, and as Rob has said repeatedly, looking at the needs to maintain the safety um, of our students and teachers as our primary, um, as, we, as we look to come back, uh, anything that we can do to reduce the number of people coming in and out of a building um, is gonna help us to be able to maintain those, um, those parameters. Um, as we look at students who are our English language learners, um, whether they're duly identified as having a special need or not, they are identified as the state as being students who are at high risk. Um, so prior to the beginning of the school year, I'll be working with our ELL teacher um, to establish a protocol for communicating with families, um, securing translators to assist in that process, and identifying when and how those students may need to come on site for direct in-person supports um, as the barriers and challenges of remote um, learning is a particular challenge for those students. And then for students who receive um, accommodations through 504 plans, Building-based coordinators will work with um, building administration and families to coordinate how those services will be provided through the general education setting. Um, and then the last little note is whether it's in a hybrid or remote, um, if students require um, and we need to get them on site for uh, services as a student with special needs or high risk needs, we will be working to coordinate transportation for them even in the remote model that is our obligation and we will move forward on how to do that. That's it. Uh, the last section, believe it or not, section I, certification of health and safety requirements. The Rockport Public Schools have met or in the process of meeting all of the health and safety requirements outlined in DESE guidance issued to all schools in Massachusetts. An on-site audit of all school buildings was conducted to identify the location and types of signage needed to support the adherence of both local and DESE health and safety guidance. Additionally, in cooperation with both a consulting infectious disease control nurse, local board of health, and the Rockport Fire Department, an on-site walkthrough assessment was conducted. Building leadership, facilities maintenance uh, management, school-based health and safety office staff, and union representation also participated. The purpose of this exercise was to identify and map out safe, reasonable, and approved foot traffic patterns based in both local and DESE health and safety guidance, as well as recently revised fire code. Proper signage is being ordered based on the approved plan. An additional walkthrough of the facilities will take place for purposes of final approval prior to the affixing of signage. Orientation in a mock walkthrough will be conducted with all staff prior to the return of our students to the buildings. The remaining health and safety requirements, such as the completion of the certification and or repair of our HVAC systems in all three schools, will be completed prior to our anticipated shift from a remote to a hybrid model of, of delivering instruction. And the HVAC system uh, group uh, that works with Leahy Hospital and their systems is coming in um, next week to go through all of our systems and to determine what we have need to do and how we meet uh, regulations and requirements. So that's our plan. I, I would just sum it up with um, the statement of conviction that we decided on a remote plan out of the desire to have the most prudent and safe plan that we possibly could for our kids and our educators and our overall community that is affected by a congregation of 800 uh, folks potentially in one location. Uh, we were discouraged a little bit last week when we saw the case count statewide go from what had been dropping into the hundreds to now tickling the 300s. We were concerned with Governor Baker's announcement last week that he was reconsidering his next steps of his plan. Uh, he detailed some facts of specific gatherings and then talked about uh, wanting to reduce the gathering size down to only 25 individuals. So that 
made us think about, you know, what is a hallway? What is a, a school system, a cafeteria, an auditorium, any different than a gathering? And you're dealing with young people who we need to make sure understand how important it is to be as safe as possible for themselves and their entire community and may have spent a summer doing that and may not have spent a summer doing that. So we and me specifically carry the burden of making this recommendation. Uh, felt it important that we not lead the way in this, that we not charge out, that we be able to move conservatively and be able to look in our rearview mirrors later on and know that we did the right thing and the safest thing and that if necessary, we catch up with a small amount of time that occurs before October, that we refine our remote model, which we're gonna to have to use, and we get it right, and then we are proud of where we are in terms of what we did for our community. We certainly don't wanna be in a situation where we miscalculate and we find out by watching another system who may be charged out in a full hybrid and all of a sudden they had to shut down because of cases occurring in their building that were more than just spot cases that became clusters. Because the minute that happens, in my opinion, you lose the trust and confidence of everybody that has to work within that school. So I personally think the remote model, even though I like it, I was a hybrid uh, a person a few weeks ago, when I started to read some of the, the level of concerns of our educators, the dynamics of what's going on, knowing what's happening in a busy summer, watching some things like uh, graduations at area schools, including our own, but some of them not being held in a very safe manner. That kids didn't have masks on at one particular school, and the Facebook uh, post was alive with pictures of, of kids without masks on and sporting events, kids without masks on. And we have too much at stake in my mind with regard to our most precious resource in Rockport, which is our children and their associated families to not get this right. So I think the remote is the right way to go. And I would turn things back over to you, Michael, and stop the screen share. Okay, thank you, everybody. You've been really patient. That's a lot of information to digest and a lot of narration later at night. I do want to get to your voices. I've tried to answer as many questions I can, as I can real time, but it's a little kludgy because they're actually going to Mike Montgomery, who's sending them to me. And rather than hearing my voice, I, I think we'd all on the school committee like to hear your voices. So. If your question hasn't been answered, I'm gonna suggest that we get to hear it in your voice asking it. Um, and Mike, what is the best way for people to signal they have um, a question or a response? So the best way would be to use the hand raise function. So you should have a hand raise function at the bottom that'll put a little hand up uh, in our participants list and uh, Michael Kelly can see that and call on you. I can, huh? Okay. Nicole, could you raise your hand because you just happen to be on my screen so I can see if I can see it? Okay, thank you. You probably don't have a question. All right. Let's see how good I am at pattern recognition. There is a question while I'm looking for the first one. There's a question about kindergarten screenings and would they be conducted and if so, how? So maybe we can start off with that one while I'm looking for hands. I'd, uh, I'd hand that to Todd. So we'd have to unmute Todd, I would imagine. Yep, he just got it. Okay. So um, we're still working on the process for kindergarten screenings, whether that's going to be <clears throat> partially in person, partially remote, um, is still in the works in terms of how exactly that's going to work. So that. We'll probably have an answer to that question in the next week or two um, as we move forward. Uh, we have a question or a comment from Dave Perry. So I guess we'll unmute you, Dave, so you can ask it. Dave, you should be able to unmute now. <laughs> well, thanks very much for having this meeting tonight. 
I know I'm a, I'm a grandparent, not a parent, but I am really concerned about the education of my grandson and the other students at Rockford High School. You know, these are such incredibly important years and we need to make sure that they get all the, the education they need for their futures. Uh, I know I have a, a, a grandson with uh, learning disabilities and working over the internet is incredibly difficult for him. Is there any way that we can compensate for that? I think the goal, Dave, is that we transition into the hybrid, which is not perfect, but it's helpful. It heads us towards the direction of bringing kids in live, but we need to make sure that you know some of the physical parts of the building, especially the ventilation are right, or we'll be shutting down and we'll be in a mode where if we have to shut down, the confidence level of returning at that point will be, I think, shaky at best. So we're hoping to be able to bring kids in that need the actual services in terms of being at risk and, and do that live. Now, whether your grandkids are in that uh, particular group or not, I don't know, but, but we are committed to bringing in kids that do not do well in the remote model. And I'm hopeful that if we get our handle you know, back on the virus, it doesn't head the wrong direction as the summer ends, that in, no, we wouldn't start to September 16th anyway. So I, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but Columbus Day is October 7th, I think. So we're only three or four weeks, which is a period of time of importance into the school year before hopefully we would be bringing your grandchildren back at least every other day in a live mode situation. There's no way we can pull off a full return because we just can't meet the safety guidelines. So that's the best that we possibly could do. And then, you know, you really hope that the uh, information and, uh, you know, one of the guys I trust the most, uh, you know, Dr. Fossey's right, that somehow, you know, we get a, a suitable vaccine in place to enough people so that we salvage some part of this year in a, a full situation. That's everybody's goal. But I think the hybrid at least will answer that. And if we're cautious now, I think we have a better chance of pulling off the hybrid in October than we do just swinging the doors open, not having the ventilation right, not knowing about the metrics, not being serious with our kids about the mask protocols and all those kind of things, and also not dealing with buildings that not only have poor ventilation, but are in 90 degree temperatures. And that's a very, very tough situation to pull off live education in a regular school system in these first few weeks of school, let alone add the stress and uncertainty. So I understand your concern. And my hope is that when we get to mid-October, we're, we're flying with a successful hybrid. And maybe we've learned some things from other school systems that make us you know, do it better and we don't make a mistake in that situation. So I, I hope that, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't completely answer your question, but our goal is to get the kids in live just as soon as we possibly can, as safe as we can. We have a um, question from someone identified as parents. So parents, Mike's gonna unmute you. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yep, go ahead. So you had said the purpose of the meeting was so the parents could talk, but and that nothing was set in stone, but so what is it that you think the parents would say or could say to change this? Because it seems pretty set in stone to me. Well, we had to give you a scenario to react to. So maybe what would be best would be, what is it that concerns you? I totally do not want a full remote and maybe this will be for a month. Maybe it'll be for a year, okay. but I really think that we could start out at a hybrid way, but I don't think that we could, the parents have much say other, you know, I, what you just read the 23 pages. I mean, I don't see that changing. 
Well, I mean, we have to submit something to DESE. So we created a working model that we then changed from the preliminary model. And now we're looking for your input. So we hear you that you don't want to do this model. Um, so, uh, you know, unless there's something else you want to express or more detail, um, you know, we're going to take it into consideration, but it doesn't give us much to work with to say, I just don't like this. I, mean, I, I get it, but I just... So we've had 29 it's... subject matter experts working on what can we feasibly do given our building, given our constraints, given the feedback we've gotten from both parents and um, educational resources about their comfort level. So this mm -hmm. is what that team came up with. So if there's something specific you want to react to, um, that's great. And if not, we, we hear you, we hear the pain, but, um, what about the recent, they just came out even a couple of days ago that if we're in this white zone, that there has to be an extenuating circumstance to not do a hybrid or a in-person. Right. So that was something that came out yesterday mm -hmm. as a result of a lot of pressure put on the governor to come up with some sort of state leadership on the issue. So we've had probably 12 hours to digest that. That's one data point. There's a meeting with the Board of Health tomorrow night to help us assess you know, to what extent that should drive our decision making. So we, we've seen it, but we also have to balance every time a new piece of information comes out, whether it's a 24% increase on cases that are reported that has been the two week to two week average in Massachusetts, or whether it's Rockport not having a case um, in the last two weeks, we have to put that all together with everything else that's impacting the school system, decide what to do with that information. So I hear you, it was kind of stunning to see it yesterday. And I think we're taking that under advisement, but, um, you know, we haven't had much time to actually process it. Yeah, I understand. That's just, it really, I was not expecting a full remote plan, especially since it was set forth a hybrid last month. Yep. And you're not alone. You're not alone. And that's why we wanted this feedback because we want a gut check. I mean, it seems like it's going the opposite direction instead of the direction that it should go as parents. But, you know, I feel, I really don't feel like we have a choice. We don't have a choice. We have to go with what you guys say and deal with it. And it's upsetting. I hear you. I hear you. Okay, we have a question from ISA, ISA, or ISA. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, that's okay. So, um, since we're starting remote and it's being reevaluated re October, if a hybrid or in person learning model is then decided upon, will the parents have a choice whether they send their kid to school or not? And will a remote learning option still be available? That's an easy answer. The answer to that is yes. Um, not only by our um, own convictions about education and your choice as a parent, but also by DESE regulation. If, if you choose not to send your child, then we must provide a remote learning situation for you. You would not have to send your child into a hybrid environment. And we would hope that that would be delivered by Rockport educators with Rockport curriculum and that we would have enough educators that we could still deliver remote to those individuals that still did not feel that they wanted their child to come into the building. And um, I'm pretty confident of that. There's some, some technical details to work out with that, but I'm, I'm very confident that that will occur. That you, will, you will have that choice to do that. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yep. Okay, we have a question from Charmaine Blanchard. I know Charmaine, you had a couple of questions. One of them had to do with the music program and what will that look like in a remote model? So maybe that's a place to start. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I was wondering about um, Mr. Cohen. I mean, he's an incredible asset to our school district and I have, one child that's starting middle school and one child that's starting high school. And specifically in high school, um, my child picked chamber music as well as orchestra. So I missed or I didn't understand what was said about music because if you're not 
going to offer music in the remote learning capacity, what will happen with those class slots that are not filled at that, at that time then for those students? I would ask Amy maybe to weigh in on that and Nathan may be on the call, but um, what I think I, I detailed out, Charmaine, is that if, if, if we were in a remote model, that the DESE regulations say it cannot incur indoors, or right. even if we were in a fully uh, all present model, they're saying because of the nature of music and singing and use of instruments, that it could only be held outdoors and only with 10 feet of separation and with masks on everybody. So you think about how does that occur with certain instruments? How, how do you pull off chorus that way? But I do believe that in our remote model, there, there will still be delivery of music instruction. And I will pass off to Amy to be able to detail if there's any other information on that or, or to Nathan if you're on the that's, call. That's fine, Charmaine. Uh, that's part of the reason actually why we had been looking towards remote is because music in particular really couldn't function. I mean, not the whole reason, but part of the reason couldn't function in our hybrid model because they couldn't, many of their classes are 60, 70 kids. So we did not have the space to create outdoor spaces for them. So they all had, I believe, and if they're on this call, they can certainly chime in, um, thought that the remote model would allow them to continue their programming as scheduled across the district, K, K through 12. So that does actually lead me into my next point. Um, it seems, and a lot of parents have discussed this, um, with regard to hybrid, I mean, clearly I think that's what people were hoping for. And then, you know, with the, the safety, I understand nobody wants their child to get sick. But with the hybrid, why can't we have some of these classes outdoors, at least during the fall when the weather would be allowed for that? I, I just don't understand why we can't have a special outdoors, have half the class outdoors two, two days a week, the other half indoors, and then flop it so that we can get some sort of normalcy and, and uh, you know, in-person learning. I think, Charmaine, the plan is to do some, if, if we get into the hybrid, to do some outdoor instruction. There's even some discussion of, uh, and other districts have looked at this, of buying tents, not ones with drop down sides, but covers so that you could actually hold a larger class outside and that we would utilize outside spaces as much as possible. So there is some discussion about that, but we have to get into hybrid mode to do that. And then you have to play out, well, how's that going to occur in December or late November? And, you know, that'll just be something we have to deal with, but that's not off the table to be able to utilize outside as much as possible. The, the, the only fear we have is, you know, we just came off of, uh, you know, two or three years of active shooter training and all that sort of thing. And to put large groups of students outside of the building is sort of adverse to that whole concept of keeping kids in spaces where they can be safe. Not that we didn't have recesses and outdoor phys ed and that kind of thing, but you could be putting a lot more kids out into situations that you can't protect them as well in the last sort of crisis we had, which was dealing of coming off of a horrible situation in Parkland, Florida. So that has not left our minds, but I, I think we do want to do some outdoor learning and outdoor education, and that is on the table for when we get to the hybrid. My last question is, has there been any decision on fall sports, particularly for high school sports, um, middle school sports? Yeah, we're promised that from the commissioner who has a weekly call for superintendents that he will have an answer for that next week. Now, I actually may have heard that last week about next week, but it has to come pretty quick. And the, the, there, there are sort of two competing forces. There's the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, MIAA, that regulates sports and plans and all that kind of stuff. And then there's Department of, of, of the Elementary and Secondary Education that governs all of education. There's a little bit of a power struggle between those two groups as to who makes that call. I think ultimately the Supreme Court for that, in my opinion, is the Department of Education will determine that. Now they may change schedules around, they may change seasons around, 
They may allow some sports, but not others, but they have not given that decision to us yet as to what fall sports would look like. Uh, John, unless you've heard anything different, is that a pretty good summation? Thank you, Superintendent Lebo. Yes, that's, that's accurate. Um, fall sports have already been pushed back. If, if they start, they would start on September 14th and it would be a modified schedule. Um, and we're still waiting for answers from above to whether they're gonna happen or not. Thank you very much, Mr. Parisi. Yep, you're welcome. Ingrid Brown. Ingrid Brown has a question and she keeps bouncing back and forth on the list of hands up, so she should get to go next. Okay, it's actually Laurel Wheeler. I, the computer changed uh -huh. the name. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, as a parent, uh, what's going to be done to support the incoming seniors um, who already have not had assistance in writing their college essays, which should have happened at the end of junior year. Um, I know most of them haven't taken SATs. They haven't been able to tour colleges. But with the guidance department being on hiatus, um, I can speak personally for my child, there's a huge amount of anxiety going into this school year with the uncertainty of, he just doesn't know what he's doing in terms of applying to colleges and not to mention the risk of losing everything that's fun about being a senior. Um, mm -hmm. But what is going to be done in the very near future to support them um, in getting ready to apply to colleges in the next couple of months? would ask Amy to weigh in on that, I think, unless the guidance counselors are here as well. Hi, Laurel. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> Uh, so that's a great question and one that I know the guidance staff, guidance staff does not technically work over the summer, but they have been actively working on online curriculum to support the junior class, specifically incoming senior class. So that is part of our planning and processing for the week before school starts and then the first 10 days of PD um, built in to you know, learn how to kind of take everything that we typically do in the building and create virtual platforms for that. Um, similarly to what I said about the schedule is we, I will host a high school specific forum for, you know, to go over the schedule and any other concerns that parents have about, you know, different cohorts of kids and different high school specific issues, probably, you know, over the next couple of weeks, once we have a schedule firm in place and more information and, and I'll have the guidance staff there so they could answer that in more detail, but it is definitely on the radar in terms of needing to support those kids most. Just like we just finished off the senior class from this year, we had their graduation finally last week. And so that was you know, a, a great deal of stress for that, those students and families, getting them through that and now shifting the focus to our current senior class. Okay. Hey, it's Ruth Price. Oh, hi. Um, it, uh, Mike just unmuted me, sorry. So oh, no, that's I, okay. I apologize, I just got off the beach late. But mm -hmm. um, we are definitely planning to provide once we learn where we're gonna go, whether it's gonna be a Zoom session, just like we do a Common App a boot camp, we will be providing that, whether it's in person, if we get permission to do small groups, or if we're gonna be doing it virtually, but we um, are very excited and anxious to work with our seniors because we also feel that we haven't had that kind of time one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but we will absolutely meet their needs 100%, and um, we have many, online programs that will be helping that. And of course, we'll do the one-on-one -on -one individual Zoom sessions as well if we cannot meet with them, small group. But um, I, I just wanna make sure that, I mean, obviously the academic concerns are, are huge, but their emotional concerns, um, I wanna make sure that that's really addressed as well because last year's seniors did lose, you know, the last quarter of their year, but this year's incoming seniors have the potential to lose absolutely everything that comes, you know, basically with being a senior. And there's gonna be a lot of, there already is, but will continue to be a lot of emotional fallout from that. I, yes, and as a parent of a senior at Manchester Essex, and also as the guidance coordinator, I absolutely share your concerns. And I will do 100% um, guidance of myself as Courtney Wilson, we will be meeting both their social, emotional, and academic wellness needs to the best of our ability and supporting their college applications without a doubt. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the best name on this list, Not of This Earth, has a couple of questions about homeschooling, whether those hours would count, et cetera. So Mike, 
he could unmute not of this earth. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm sorry about the the logo up there. It didn't let me change my name. I uh, I'm <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'm Steve McDonald. I have a daughter um, in the. I think she's going into her junior year. Um, and this is, it's a three part question. I wrote it out, so I'll just read it as I wrote it. Uh, what accommodation, if any, will there be for homeschool options? If we choose to homeschool until full integration, would my daughter be able to shift back to RHS at that time? And would the hours that she has put into homeschool be credited to her as she goes back to public school? I think as a parent, you always have the right to homeschool, regardless of the situation we're, that, that we're in right now. And um, my understanding of it is you don't just homeschool and you're out the entire year. You would have the ability, if this we weren't in the situation we're in right now, to reconsider that and to then re-enroll your child into a public school that you have a right to receive the education at. So in order to homeschool, though, you have to fill out a form. You have to show us what the right. curriculum is. I have to sign off on that. But right. remember, we will be providing a remote option, even if we're in hybrid, that would be much like homeschool. And I would think better because it would be with our teachers and our curriculum, which would then, if you decided to not do remote at a certain point, you would have the ability at certain checkpoints, maybe not just in an instant day that you could say, I want to go from remote back into live, but at the you know quarter breaks or whatever, you could say, okay, I've, I've changed my mind a little bit and I think I'm okay to try hybrid. And then you can always say, nope, not working. I'm going to go back to remote. But if you choose homeschool, if this was a regular year, right now you'd be sending me a form, I'd be signing off on it, and uh, you'd give, be giving me a report at the end of the year as to what you did, and that's what's required for homeschooling. So you you do not lose that ability or that option. Okay, thank you very much. The, the, the one fallout of that, collateral damage for us a little bit, not to influence your decision, is, is that if you're in a remote mode, you still count as one of our enrolled students mm -hmm. in terms of our chapter 70 funding and that kind of stuff. If, if you choose to go fully homeschool, then you're not in that enrollment and we don't get sort of the money back on, a, on, on your child as if we would if they were either in school, in hybrid, or in remote. If you're in remote, you're counted as enrolled in our school and that is helpful to us financially, but it's totally your decision as to what you do you, you know, with regard to homeschooling. Right, thank you very much. Yep. Question from Lori. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, so the question is, um, how much training have the teachers had on remote teaching? Because it's a whole different teaching style than in-person teaching. And my experience in the spring was it was a total flop. Um, the 10 days that you're taking in the spring seem like they're packed with other training events. How much experience, uh, well, how much training are the teachers getting have they had already? in remote teaching it's a whole different style many of our teachers have taken workshops and courses over the summer in remote uh, teaching uh, i think they will be better at it than then when it was thrust upon them when they had to go you know with their own lives turned over um, the 10 days are going to focus tremendously on being able to pull off our opening model uh, I would defer to the professional development committee folks that are here or the teacher association folks to be able to detail that. Um, will we be perfect with remote? Um, probably not until you've done it for a long period of time because it's, uh, it, it, it is a different way of doing business, but we certainly are going to be better than we were in the spring when we were told no grades shall be given, just credit, no credit. Right. And uh, we didn't have to take attendance. So you had a sort of a problem with your audience, you know, being fully engaged and, and knowing that they had a, a sense of purpose and of accountability, which helps you engage with the learners also. 
because they also told us no child will be held back. So if you were a kid, it, 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 for some kids, it didn't take them very long to figure out. So if I don't do any work, nothing's going to happen. I won't get a grade and I'm going to move on to the next grade no matter what happens. That created, in some cases, an audience that wasn't uh, in the perfect position to learn. I think starting a new school year off that way, rather than turning it off in March, we, we have a better chance to pull off remote than we did back in the spring. So we understand spring was, was not a good situation, even though we did get a lot of positive feedback from uh, parents as to how it was pulled off, especially at the elementary level, that people felt really, really good about how it occurred. And then there were pockets, depending on the teacher and the situation or the class, that the feeling was not quite as, as strong as that. So we're committed to, to make this as strong as we can. Even in a hybrid, we've got to do the, rem the remote part 50% of the time. And we got to be good at that. Otherwise, the kids are only going to get half an education during the year. And, and that's not good for anybody since they already lost the spring to only get a half an education this year would be tragic for kids. So I, I can't guarantee you, but I know people have been working on it. I know people have been researching it. They at least knew they'd have to do half remote no matter what. And it has to be on their mind as to how can I pull this off? How can I be better at this? You know, because we all want to do what's right by kids. And that's why our teachers teach. That's why they do what they do and, uh, and don't do some other things that, you know, could be more highly paid or, you know, receive more accolades and that kind of thing. They, they are committed to making this right for our kids. Hey, Lori, thank you for your question. Can I ask you, um, as someone who's done hundreds of performance reviews, it's pretty devastating to hear the entire experience was a flop. And if that's what it was for you, and that's what it was. But what if, but if what you're really trying to say is some teachers were better than others in terms of remote learning, it might be a good idea to give that feedback to the principal mm -hmm. of that building so that if there is a real issue there or there's additional support needed, it's a much more positive way of getting that teacher the help they need or the experience they need or the items surfaced. But, um, you know, so just a suggestion as you go forward, if you found that that varied, I, I found for my own children, the experience varied from exceptional, 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 thank you, and room for an improvement. And yeah. it's important to give that feedback, I think, to the principals so that um, it's not just a categorical, the whole thing was terrible. Well, no, no, it wasn't a complete flaw, but like even the teachers were zoning out at the end. I mean, you know. Sure. I, I was working remotely from home and my kid would come upstairs, you know, in the middle of the day and I'd be like, what are you doing here? Don't you have class? Oh no, uh, so-and-so canceled. Like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I don't want to see you. Right. You're good upstairs. That's what are you supposed to be? <laughs> You're supposed to be in class. I hear you. Yeah, well, greatness was thrust upon a lot of people. I know. But yeah, if you could, you know, going forward, if you're finding that there's an uneven performance, maybe the best way to get feedback in is to go through the building principles so that they can figure out what's going on. Yeah, no, it wasn't a total fail, but it, like really towards the end, when it was the, the end of the year, it was like, and I don't know whether they had regularly scheduled appointments that they were canceling classes or whatever the deal was but you know he's coming up to visit me way too often and <laughs> okay well one suggestion is get a lock for that door and then he can't get in at you all right so brenda wood's hand is turning blue she's been holding it up so long we unmute brenda wood at least the icon is blue hi everyone thank you i have young children as you can hear in the background i'm sure um so at the elementary level the remote experience really required a parent to be there the entire time there are seven websites with seven different logins there's an inability at that age group in k through three or four to say i have school for four hours today and i'm independently going to do my work because they're seven eight years old they're young 
Are there going to be any efforts put into place to maybe ease that pain, have less systems, more screen times? I'm sorry. Sorry. Lillian, please. Um, more with the teachers online and less applications and set them up to do be successful on a more independent basis since we have often, many of us have two working parents. Todd, we'll in on that. Yeah, so that was a big concern in our consideration for when we built the remote plan. Um, two two things on that point. One is um, is creating some more flexibility in terms of the timing by having the pre-recorded lessons um, so parents could access them when they were available to do it. And two was to reduce the amount of online time um, in terms of the work that they were doing in K through two. Um, well, K through five, but especially in K through two. So if there were additional options for them um, in paper-based work potentially or, or other options um, that didn't require accessing so many um, levels of technology. Um, there's obviously, you know, there's, there's a point where we, you know, there are things that they need, we need them to access technology-wise in terms of instruction, some of it in reading, some of it, some of it so that we can collect the data that we need to collect to, be able to, to figure out where they're at. But it, it certainly is a, um, a focus of our plan and something that we understand is a concern for parents as well. Okay. We're gonna go next to Allison Beal. And while Mike is unmuting her, Rob, a question that keeps coming up in my IMs are, okay, so if we're reevaluating in October, what are the criteria? What is the criteria for actually going to the hybrid model? All right, I think one of the biggest ones is making sure the building has been certified as safe, especially the ventilation, getting that off the table. Uh, there was a little bit of concern about some mold in classrooms, which is probably an annual concern. Uh, the ventilation probably was more in the background and uh, a serious irritant for people. So that would be the first part. And then I think the um, Board of Health and the school committee and myself, as well as the Teachers Association, ha have to be able to settle in on what are the metrics? You know, what are the entry metrics? Even though they gave those out to us yesterday at noon, they're based on cases per 100,000. So they're in the four or five cases per 100,000. And I think one of the things that happens when you have a small community and you take it down to, I, I don't have the number of of residents in Rockport right on right on the tip of my tongue, but I know it's not a hundred thousand, and we, we, that becomes then a very inexact science with regard to that. So we're going to have to know what the metrics are and what the established metrics are to be able to then turn the key into a hybrid. But I, I think those are the two biggest things, and the, the the Board of Health would would be helping us with that. So I'm not sure if that's completely clear, but we certainly have to get the, the building concerns solidified and off the table. And then, uh, you know, make sure our, our teachers and support staff and educators are comfortable coming back into a building with whatever metrics are going on at the time. Well, and also the parents, because I mentioned the two polls that we took a few weeks ago, and we had a majority of people saying they weren't comfortable coming back in certain scenarios. So. You know, it's a synchronization too of what parents need to be able to send their kids with the assurance that it's going to be safe and the people who are teaching them need to feel like they're in a safe environment. So I think it's probably fair to say, because this is a, a question that comes up a lot with the school committee that, you know, we're evaluating what, what criteria would apply and we will make that public. But right now the building concern is the one that's the leading indicator. All right, so Allison, are you unmuted? I believe so. Can all you right. hear me? Yes. All right, first, thanks everybody for um, working through this. I don't envy you at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question kind of ties in with what Rob was just talking about when you get to the hybrid model. Um, I have a daughter going into the eighth grade who is a very social creature. And my question is, and it probably goes for all grade levels, um, the sanitation throughout the school day and like bathroom breaks and stuff like that. Is there a plan in place for that? Or are you kind of waiting to get to that moment of- Actually pretty solid on that. One of the committees worked on that. Uh, the bathrooms are gonna be cleaned hourly. 
Uh, there'll be sign outs. So there'll only be one student in a bathroom at one time. Uh, hallways are basically one way travel. Staircases are one way. Actually, the hallways are, are two way separated travel in most places. The staircases are one way travel. Uh, we have the benefit of being able to get, I call them Zambonis, but they're not. Those do ice. But we have these machines that do this viral cleaning. They can do an entire room in three minutes, even though one thing we put out said 30 minutes can actually be done in three minutes. You go in and you spray that room and that room is then sprayed with antiviral uh, material that coats the entire space and, and kills that. So you are able, and I, I could have Kirk weigh on, on that, go through the entire buildings and sanitize those buildings on a nightly basis in between those cohorts. Because one of the questions we have, well, how come you don't put cohorts back to back and then have one day between those groups? Why are you going every other day? Doesn't that make it difficult? We're assured that that cleaning ability, and we have two of those machines because we ended up with an extra one, believe it or not, that, that are paid for through the COVID uh, care funds and that kind of thing that will really allow us to, to clean that. The other thing I want to note is that our teachers association and support staff agreed to take on the wiping down of their desks and door handles because a custodian would not be able to go through all those spaces. So our teachers who are gonna be asked to teach live, teach remote, do all the things they have to do, also agreed as part of a working condition, which is one of the things they negotiate to help us out with the cleaning of their own classrooms. And they know their classrooms best. Uh, in art rooms and those kind of things, they won't be able to share materials. They'll have to have their own sets of pens and pencils and chalk or whatever. They can't hand stuff back and forth. So I feel really good about the PPE part, the materials that are there. We have over eighty to ninety thousand dollars of uh, masks and shields and sneeze guards. We're ready for a hybrid opening. We have an isolation room in each building for a kid that appears to have symptoms that can then be separated out and then be able to be removed from the building safely to then go through a test. There are protocols in place from DESE about uh, if you have X number of kids, what do you do with the close contacts? We're pretty clear on that kind of stuff. That, that, that's not the part that I'm, I'm really worried about. I, I think we got out on that up front. We got out the ordering quickly. There, there are many places that are getting back orders on all the stuff because they waited and waited. June San Filippo got out and Martha Wright and Kurt Keating ordered things right off the bat. And, and we probably ordered more than we should have, but I'd much rather have more sneeze guards than no sneeze guards because they're back ordered. Chromebooks, we talked about technology, are like, unless you call the governor or Commissioner Riley, you may not get new Chromebooks until next January, even if you need them to open school because they come from some foreign country and they're not available, but the state promised they would help us get them. That's not our greatest worry. Our greatest worry were masks and uh, you know, all the kind of hand sanitizer. Our town helped us out with 55 gallon drums of gel sanitizer that we pick up tomorrow. So I'm not worried about water fountains and hallways. I'm worried about mask adherence. I'm worried about will kids when they're out of a class walk down a hallway and not drop it uh, because that breaks the whole cycle. Uh, I continue to wonder as my past as an assistant principal and a high school principal, how that would have worked when I was in those, those situations in terms of getting all kids to understand how important it is when some people have not bought into that particular aspect. But we are supplied appropriately in that area. That, that's the least of my worries in that situation. Thanks. Heidi Morin and Jennifer Witten have a question. There are about 10 questions in queue, just wondering. Yes, we do. Um, well, first of all, we have concern about working parents and elementary school age students. 
Um, another question is, why was two days, be it two days consecutively or two days alternating chosen? And what comes of the two days? Why was it chosen? Uh, members of the committee on, on the scheduling of the hybrid pattern, want to weigh in on this? Who would you I like guess. <laughs> so, you, so your question is why the alternating two day model? Is that the question? Why were two days chosen as opposed to a week on, a week off, or more specifically and more sensibly, two weeks on and two weeks off. Yeah, I think that's right. Quarantine for 14 days when you come into the state. That one's a little easier, I think. That, that, that particular question as you framed it, why not one week on, one week off, or two weeks on, two weeks off? The commissioner actually out of his mouth when he started to talk about hybrids was one week on, one week off. But almost every school system that I've heard of has gone to the alternating days, either two and two with a remote or alternating. And it's because of the consistency of the education that you don't have kids in a remote model for an entire week. Because if they start to get disengaged, you don't have them live back for another whole week. And then if a, a kid happens to be sick during that time, you might not have them back for 10, 15 days, you've lost them. So by going every other day, you have the ability to keep those cohorts connected to each other. And that was considered by the scheduling committee to be the most solid. And I support that. I don't know if members of the committee uh, want to correct me on that or. No, I think that's right, Rob. The big thing was, uh, particularly at the elementary level, if you didn't go day on and day, day on, day off, and you went week on and week off, because of the sort of the routine based nature of elementary school, um, the, the amount of regression would be so significant <laughs> that you really would have a hard time making any progress. If you were going week on, week off. Um, essentially, every Monday would be like the first day of school for the younger kids um, because they, they would never get into the routines that we need them to get into to, to be able to learn. So we were we unanimously agreed that the day on, day off was the, the most beneficial for our students. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle Thoreau, or Thoreau, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Hi. Yeah. It's actually Lisa Lady, I don't know why I can Lisa uh, I have two questions actually. Um, the first one is Are there going to be any accommodations made for um, the high school students for their required volunteer hours? I have a junior who has 25 hours that he's completed, so he has 25 hours more to do. And I doubt that there's going to be too many PTO or other events that he's going to be able to safely do this year and get any hours in, which would mean he got half of his hours he would have to commit, I mean, complete next year when he's a senior. Uh, Amy? Hi, Lisa. Um, yeah, we have talked at length about high school graduation requirements in general. There are some things we can't be flexible. With. There are many things we will need to be given the situation. So any change in graduation requirements would have to go through the school committee. But Anne-Marie Lester as the um, community service coordinator and I have, have had conversations about the fact that that will certainly most likely need to be adjusted based on the circumstances. So I would not worry about that at the moment. And I can address that at a building-based meeting as well once we have more details, but I certainly am not gonna hold kids accountable for being out in the community if we're saying they can't even come to school, so. Okay. Um, the other question was, um, there's been some things in the news about MCAS possibly not being required. Have you all been given any information on that? Is any yeah, the Commissioner of Education has been asked that at every superintendent call with a lot of them calling for the, you need to suspend the MCAS again because of the need to work on the actual delivery of instruction and not preparation for MCAS. Uh, his standard response is no decision on that at this time. 
and he didn't say no. He said, sort of like waffled around and said, well, that will depend on the status of the virus at the, the, a later time when I make that decision. So I, I don't think we're gonna hear it up front like we did last spring. I think it's something that we're probably gonna hear you know, after Thanksgiving or around Christmas time, not as an opening statement about MCAS. I, I don't believe that's gonna happen. He has avoided that question like the plague. I guess my concern is that, you know, the spring remote learning um, was hit or miss depending on the teacher that you had. And I'm not sure that they totally got all of the materials. So for my son that was a sophomore, he basically missed a good portion of geometry and, you know, things that could be on the test. And he's not going to get a chance to learn that because he doesn't have geometry in junior year. He has algebra too. Yeah, and uh, this probably isn't the best answer, but I don't think you're alone. And I don't think we're alone. That I think, uh, depending on where you were in the state, um, we were either better or worse than that. There were some places that had 25% uh, of their student body never even logged on to remote learning in the spring. And that was more sort of in the, the cities and that kind of thing. We had pretty good engagement, but I know the state realizes that there was a difficulty with the model in the spring. And that's probably why they came out of the gate and pushed for you're ready for in person. Measure your buildings. Measure three feet. You're ready to go. You need to go back. But that's not realistic in terms of the situation because I, I can't understand why three feet would be an acceptable thing. I, I wouldn't put my child in a situation where it was three feet away. If, if I had any uncertainty at all, six feet is at least because you can, you know, make it four, make it five, but three it is just not realistic, even though they said in other countries they had studied Korea and those kind of places. Well, I think the sort of level of how schools are pulled off in some of those places is a little different than us. They may be a little more regimented. And that's not the case in American school systems and certainly not the case in our country because we have not stemmed the spread of the virus in this country where other countries basically shut it down with mandates, I think. You know, and we, we haven't had that approach. And, and I think our kids are involved in that situation too. So I would anticipate a decision about MCAS, um, but I think we'll be better, much better at delivering the standards. It wasn't until the sort of mid course checkpoint of last spring, remember they began and they said, we just want you doing enrichment. We want you working on what was previously taught. It wasn't until like coming out of April vacation that they even said to us that we could move forward in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that was very difficult to do at that point. What they're saying to us now is you will do the curriculum, you will hold kids accountable, you will have attendance, you will give grades, you will give feedback, and kids will be held back if they're not doing their work. So I think the environment will change this fall compared to the sort of loosey-goosey, out-of-nowhere situation that we had last spring that wasn't good for anybody. Thank you. Uh, I think um, Jody wanted to add something about the curriculum. Jody, good to you, Mike, would like to add, I think. Jody, are you there? Yep, I'm here. I just want, you mentioned the curriculum coverage specific to geometry, and I'm the district math specialist. So I just wanted to assure you that since the spring, the teachers have actually been um, tracking what was taught live, what was taught remotely, and what was not covered, and what was not covered based on what Desi told us to cut from our curriculum. And there's been a lot of work put into the curriculum this summer to make sure that we integrate what was missed last year into what we'll be teaching this year. So we're going to work towards making up any of those deficits. Um, your child will not miss what he missed in geometry. That will be built into his next math class. So they'll build these two algebra. Yes, working hard to build that in, um, in, in every content area. Thank you. Dave Perry has a question. Dave, are you there? I just unmuted myself. <laughs> and I am here. And, and I just wanted to encourage the decision makers 
to really think long and hard about the impact of particularly the full-time remote learning. I, th I think that no matter how you prepare, nor how you execute it, that there's gonna be a certain amount lost every month that we're on a totally remote situation. And I think it has negative effects on the students. So, it, you know, I heard all the facts about why not. Well, one of the reasons to do it is really for the students. That's all. I, I know it's a tough decision, but yep. well, I just don't want to see them all fall back. Nope, we're with you. Okay, thank you. Um, Galaxy Note 10 Plus. There I am. I'm actually not Galaxy. My name is Karen, and I have a son who is going to be a senior, and I actually have a son going into the tech as a senior as well, and I feel pretty split. <laughs> um, but I do have a question. Well, first, I want to comment that my experience at the end of the um, school year in the spring and as everything occurred last March, um, I had an amazing experience with the staff at Rockport High School. I have a child who was at IEP. Everybody knows him well, and I couldn't have possibly felt more supported by his teachers, by his support staff, by the high school to alleviate as much anxiety as they could possibly do. At one point, one of the staff members just simply said to me, listen, we got it. We got you. We got this. And I cannot express how much that meant to me. So um, as much as my son will struggle with remote learning, I'm certainly happy to have him remote learn for hopes that he will have a more prosperous and normal end of his senior year. Um, that said, I do have a question. As we move in and hopefully enter a hybrid model, what's the plan for a COVID positive student or staff member? What happens? Is there a metric? Yeah, there's a, a detailed set of protocols and I believe we were gonna post all the DESE guidance, which are public documents on our website in a folder. Mike, you can let me know if that happens, but there is one 18 page document that DESE put out on exactly what your question is, which is if a child tests positive and the contacts, how long they're asked to stay, stay home. Uh, they use the, for, for some reason they don't use the 14 day, they use a 10 day period of time at which they don't exhibit symptoms anymore before they can come back to school if they were the ones that tested positive and then they have to go to who were their close contacts but but that's all sort of um, uh, flow charted uh, by DESE and um, if if it's not posted right now we'll make sure it's posted on the website because that is an important question as to what are going to be the protocols for a staff member uh, for the superintendent for a custodian for a kindergartner, they have laid that out pretty well for us. So Mike, is that on there right now yet? No, I'll put a link to the DESE site on there. Yeah, the DESE site itself, and you can actually look this up. If you go to the Massachusetts Department of Education, there'll be a whole section and all those guidance documents they've sent to us are, and it's, it, it's probably 15 of those documents and one of which is like on transportation, one is on PPE, building modifications. We have those and can post them on our site, but you can also find them right now on DESE's site and, and be able to read that yourself. All right, that's perfect, thank you. This anyway, is all I have for questions. Well, yeah, that was it, okay. Um, Jerry Sharfstein and Rob, well, um, Mike is unleashing Jerry I have a couple of requests here. I think at our last meeting, you presented in a pie graph the results of the parent survey in terms of um, comfort levels with different scenarios. I have a couple of questions related to, will we release those materials? And I, I think anything we've shown at a, a public meeting is of course game for public release, at least based on the, the chart you showed. So, um, that may be something else that we want to put up on the website because a couple of people have expressed. Yeah, it, it, 
it's the PowerPoint we did that has, uh, you know, are you comfortable coming back to, to full? Are you comfortable coming back to hybrid? It also has uh, uh, questions about the staff themselves. And that's obviously public knowledge because it was presented in public and uh, that can easily be posted to the website. And Mike, that one's not up yet, right? Okay. Mike, did we lose Jerry? No, I'm here. Oh, there he is. Hey, Jerry. I'm here. I was just waiting, uh, waiting for the uh, for Rob to finish what he was saying. Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to talk. I have a comment and then a question. Uh, my my comment is uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, compliment everyone who has done all the work that's been done. Uh, I think you guys have done just an amazing job. I've sat in on a couple of these, and I'm very impressed with the involvement of the administration as well as the community members. And I and I applaud you for for the work you've done. And I also applaud you for the decision that you've made uh, on, on when you're gonna start in, you know, the, the hybrid uh, version of, of, of learning. Um, I think with all of the unknowns we have about this disease, that uh, to risk uh, one, of our, one of our children, or in my case, I've got two, two daughters who teach in the district, uh, and, and I don't wanna put them at any un, un, undue risk. So I applaud you for your decision. Uh, my, my question is, we've got a lot of older people living in Rockport who have a lot of skill sets. And uh, I'm wondering if, if any thought has been, been uh, made to using those skill sets in, in various ways. Obviously, I don't want to uh, you know, stir the pot and, and create problems, but I have certain skill sets. My wife was a teacher. Uh, I, I, mentioned, I think in the last uh, uh, meeting that you folks had, you said you're going to be delivering lunches to to, uh, to some of the students. You can use us as a resource. There are many of us in the community who want to help out in any way possible. So I think you need to think about that. And I don't know if you have. So I guess that's my question. Have you thought about using members of the community, such as a person who's retired, to do some things for you? Uh, we haven't laid that out yet, but I think that's an excellent suggestion. We do run into, you know, sort of issues of, uh, you know, going through screening of who has contact with our children and things like that, that we always have to consider. But uh, I think there may be ways that, you know, people could come in and maybe be guest presenters to groups of kids, uh, you know, guest readers and things like that. I'm, I'm sure there are, there are ways that we can, can use folks that, that want to help us out and take part because it's a partnership and we need the support of the community. And, you know, we're in a tough situation and you guys are in a tough situation. Uh, we're gonna be asking for an override next spring. And we need as much support as we can have around how we do school and why we're doing school. And so I think the answer is yes, but we have not sort of played that out yet, but it's, it's certainly on our radar now as to how, how can we get our partners to help us out and, and maybe make this better. Yeah, I mean, when I cross over the bridge and I see that little boat out in the harbor says, we're all in this together. I mean, that's yep. what I really believe, that this is, you know, it's not just the, the educators and the administration, it's our whole community, be it parents or grandparents. Well, that's what we're hoping that, you know, out of this real darkness comes some light. And if there's, if there's some positive things that we can look back on, in, in terms of the support of our kids, the support of our schools, uh, you know, making for a stronger community, you know, maybe we'll be able to look back, you know, in a year from now and say, oh boy, there, there were some really, really positive things from that. We got some folks that, you know, like you said, are now engaged with our kids coming in where they wouldn't, maybe it never been in, in the school before and, and it thought certain things happened one way and not another way. So you have to be hopeful because if you look at the dark side, uh, it's not a really, you know, terribly pretty picture what we're up against and the stress we're under, but there may be some some silver linings to what we do. And I think you brought up one of those possibilities already for us. So, yes, we're certainly going to consider that. Thank you. So Sean's question or comment is next. But while we're doing that, along the lines of volunteer work, Finn Brady sent me a note saying, are there potentially elementary kids who could benefit from some attention by seniors looking for community service points? So I don't think there's a need to respond to it. I'm just gonna to toss that out to both um, Amy and Todd to think about is there a way to have those students potentially support the, the youngest ones among us? So thank you for the suggestion, Finn. 
Um, and now we're on to Sean. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, I had, and you already know this, I had questions about, you know, working out uh, childcare situations for working parents. Myself and my wife, we both uh, are back to work now, but we need to work live um, and we're going to need to continue to work live. Um, and I know you mentioned there would be resources for anybody in, uh, sorry about that, um, for people in those kinds of situations. Do we know what those would look like? Do we know what the options are? Is there a timeline for, you know, when we're going to know what those are and when they'll be in place? And then uh, on top of that, uh, how do two parents get so lucky? We've also got two children on IEPs. Um, so how would a child, how would that, how would their status as being on IEPs impact any childcare resources we might need to access? Right. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, there's a presentation at the school committee. One of the agenda items is on the proposed uh, a partnership with Y in terms of being able to, you know, handle some of what you're talking about, but that, that hasn't been presented to the school committee yet. So those details are, are fully fleshed out and, and will be made public tomorrow night. So that, that meeting begins at seven. There'll be more discussion of what happened here tonight, but there'll also be that piece about that. And Todd, I don't know if you want to allude to just some sort of you know major highlights of that, or if you want to wait till tomorrow night. Yeah, I mean, I think just the brief overview is that they're looking to offer something based on the license that they already have to operate within the building and other places in town. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that if uh, a student was enrolled in that program and qualified for in-person um, special education services, it's potentially possible that they could be in the Y and get those services at some point during the course of the day if, you know, that was able to work out in the remote model. But there's, there's a lot of pieces and parts to it that still need to be worked out and approved and put into place. So. As the, are the, Details for accessing that meeting tomorrow in terms of a Zoom login available somewhere or? Yes, on the website. On the, sorry, could you say that again? I lost you for a sec. The school website and the town website post when the school committee meets so you can get them. Oh, sure, okay. All right, I great. Think it actually uses this same ID because we had, a, we had a staff meeting before this and we had to sort of, sort of keep everybody out because it uses the exact same login because I set the meeting up. So I think you'll find that you click right on what you clicked on tonight, right, Michael? And you walk into tomorrow night's meeting too, don't you? Yep. Yeah, that may work. Um, but again, we want to take a look at shifting that, uh, how we're doing these to make it a little bit more accessible and a little easier with the Q&A. So that may change. So always check the very top of the school's website has the link to it. And again, if you go to the town's website and click town uh, uh, posted meetings, you'll get a list of exactly the meeting uh, ID. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Elizabeth, you're up next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so Elizabeth is actually my daughter. My name is Melissa. I have two children in the elementary school. Okay. And I first want to share how much I appreciate the time that the school committee and the reopening committee are putting into these three plans. I do not envy the position that you are in, and I understand that your job is to do what's best for the well-being of the children, even if it makes it difficult for working parents like myself. I also appreciate your partnership in defense of the work of the teachers in the district, because as an educator myself, I know that the teachers will continue to meet students where they are at and differentiate instruction as they have always done. I share the frustration of the school committee as shared at the beginning of the meeting with the lack of guidance from the state and the too little too late input from Baker at the last minute. I too am concerned at the health and safety of the staff and the students, including the mental health of teachers who are again asked to add more to their plates. As an educator in another district, I also have huge concerns with the HVAC systems in aging schools and appreciate the transparency I have heard in this meeting regarding the importance of healthy air in schools. As a special education team chair, I know too well that you can slice data in many ways. That said, I'm sure you are aware that the AAP reports a 90% increase in child cases over the last four weeks, which aligns with the timeline of more, of more kids socializing and speaks to what we now know about asymptomatic spread in children. 
I also asked the school committee to keep in mind the reports we see in the news regarding outbreaks in schools. And while these are typically occurring in places where masks are not as widely used as they are here, they speak to they are cautionary tales as to how quickly schools and parents will have to readjust when their child needs to quarantine. I ask you to imagine the conversation you may have with your quarantine child as they sit at home waiting to see if they develop symptoms. As you may know, the president of the Massachusetts Medical Society with over 25,000 members just this week cautioned that the slow increase in cases in our state is likely suggestive of a larger outbreak heading our way. Sadly, once again, schools are expected to take on more and being looked at as a solution to childcare need rather than institutions that put what's best for kids at the forefront of all decisions. Again, I appreciate your transparency and the human aspect that is clear in this process. Thank you for the work that, has, that you all have done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Walter, I think you had had a question before and I'm not sure if it got answered, so you're on deck next. Okay, so not Walter, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, so this is Walter's mom, Marjorie Dikshinsky. Um, I'm using his Chromebook and I couldn't figure out how to change the name. Um, but as, the, as we went to remote learning last spring, this past spring, I have multiple students with multiple high risk, high need across schools. Um, and one of my hardest things was having them all on at the same time. It was checking, are you awake? Are you in class? And especially with the elementary school, it really was one-on-one -on -one making sure that they were, that student was in the right place, doing the right thing, moving on to the next um, activity. Um, and I know that the school has done a lot of training and thought a lot about how can we, you know, improve this process. And I, I like the idea of having some paperwork, especially at the elementary school level. I guess um, to ease some of like the parent anxiety and the, the, you know, give the kids some guidance, would there be an availability to know and to maybe email with the team chair or the grade level liaisons prior to that September start date? Martha? Sure, hi Marjorie, how are you doing? We're so, here. Um, Good, good. Um, so in the first 10 days and, and even prior to um, four days before um, the 31st, before like we come back for a full time kind of teacher training, team chairs will be coming on site. Um, and what we're going to be doing is there will be indiv individual calls out to families to talk about individual students, um, to talk about what, even in a remote um, model the guidance from desi is for us to work with our staff and to work with families as partners in determining when and how we can potentially get kids on site even in a remote because kids who have um high level needs or complex needs social emotional needs that are all linked in that those are the kids that are um are at risk um i i don't like the desi language because they talk about priority uh plans and i um, i just don't I know that we have kids who are high risk, but I think all of our kids are all our priority. That's why we do what we do. Um, so if I, when we say things like that, it's just to um, really identify the kids who want to get on site as much as possible, as soon as possible. Uh, the, the goal is to have it as close to September 16th for opening day for school for kids. A lot of that will be contingent upon um, the information we get back around the HVAC and the air quality. But um, as Rob has shared with us, Kirk repeating our um, Director of Grounds and Facilities is really on top of that, so we're hoping to have those things tucked away. But you will be getting individual calls, um, and we'll be doing outreach. Um, I'm here. I'm working every day, so if you, I may not be able to have um, a definitive conversation, but don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have particular questions before you might hear from a team chair. Uh, well, thank you very much. No, I absolutely. Um, you know, I had a student in the summer program, and that they were very helpful with some. Good guidance and anything that anxiety um but I, I think that it's it's been a it's a huge um process for the special yeah. education department and um you know i'm really thankful that everyone stayed on to this meeting so long tonight too it's been a lot of information and um there's still a lot to go but thank you very much yep we're here you call i'm here every day all right 
Okay, Stephanie Boone is up next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, myself personally, I'm I'm very disappointed, I guess, in in the decision to go fully remote as opposed to what I was anticipating as being a hybrid option. I have students in both entering into high school this year as well as a student in elementary school, and I have um, concerns about how we're going to be able to maintain the level of education that we have come to expect from the Rockport school system in a remote learning module, even if it is only for a period of time. I know we're saying October, realistically, is that possible? I don't know. Um, so given the fact that it's going to be at least short term, if not longer term, um, from an educational perspective, making sure that they're getting the academics that are needed during the, this critical period of time so that they don't continue to fall far and farther behind. And I know we're saying everybody's in the same boat, everybody's doing the same thing, but I don't think that's necessarily the right answer. Um, so I guess I have a couple of specific, two specific questions, one related to my elementary student and one related to my high school student. So from an elementary school perspective, remote learning last year, while I absolutely adored my daughter's teacher, was not successful for my daughter. She, um, you know, the amount of learning that she actually received during that period of time, I do not think was, was very successful. And when I hear things like we're going to go to recorded lectures as opposed to a Zoom meeting that's more interactive with a teacher teaching to kids from a remote perspective, which is at least more interactive than, than just sitting and listening to a lecture. I have concerns about, about that from a, a how do we engage our students and ensure that they're retaining the information rather than just giving them a, a lecture that's online that they have to watch and then do a, a piece of paper assignment that they're doing somewhat independently, but they're at home, so how are we tracking that? Um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that curriculum aspect from an elementary perspective. Rob, you wanna comment on that? Yeah, so I didn't, I, I didn't explain it all that thoroughly and the initial um, review of the plan, but the it, it's not that they're going to be solely delivering recorded plans. It's the it's if a teacher was going to be delivering instruction with a recorded plan, they would still be live in and available. For example, in a Zoom meeting while that instruction was happening, or they may very well be delivering it live and recording the Zoom meeting and using that as a resource for parents to be able to access. So we're not, we're not eliminating that sort of face-to-face -face piece. What we're trying to do is resolve the issue of parents being able to access that instruction outside of that instructional time, I guess, um, by sort of closing that gap with it. Um, the answer to your other question about the work piece of it, um, I think part of it is gonna, gonna have to be the transfer from um, to, to more sort of uh, paper-based learning for the lower grades, giving them more sort of hands-on activities and things that they can submit um, and shifting away as much as we can from um, work that is computer-based um, and can sometimes be a little bit more distracting or a little less engaging for, for some of our, our lower elementary kids. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that explanation. I would encourage that you potentially look at the option like you mentioned where they do it in person and, and, and record that for later use. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of the same questions get asked over and over again and perhaps those individuals that need to watch it at a later date would benefit significantly from those questions that are asked by other students in the class. Um, so thank you. And I get my second question related to high school um, so my other daughter is a is going to be a freshman. So it's her first foray into high school. Um, she is scheduled to take a pretty aggressive course load of activities that are almost all honors classes. And I'm concerned from a remote aspect how, you know, you get so much more from an in-person lesson and 
how are we making sure that these kids aren't necessarily having to teach themselves at this high level and that they are still getting that that level of, of interaction and question and answer and in-depth um, learning at, at, at all levels. It doesn't matter if it's high school or, or, or CP or honors or CP. How are we making sure that their, their access to um, that level of, of learning is maintained? Thanks, Mike. Um, I think that's a great question. And I think that, I mean, honestly, I struggle with this with the high school students. I also struggle with it. I have elementary school students in Rockport. And so I, I hear the frustration and the pain and witnessed it <laughs> firsthand of my own kids too. But I think the one, um, and I don't think any of us, I say this to the teachers all the time, I don't think any of us would choose this model if this was like what we would choose to teach children. Um, I don't think it's the best. I think we need to get back to school. Um, I think given the situation we're in, the only thing I can say is that the one silver lining that's come from it is that it's really, really made us look at our curriculum and stroll out the standards and really go through and highlight essential questions. What do we actually want the kids to know? Really organize our systems and really um, elevate our expectations in a clearer way than I think you know, not that we haven't done a great job of that in the past, but at the high school, things are very segmented. So, you know, you may teach biology and then there's chemistry and then there's, there's teachers are sort of in silos just because there isn't any time for common planning at the high school. And so I think that we've built in those structures and our goal for this year would be to really, um, in the spring, we weren't able to hold the kids so much accountable. So I think a lot of the feedback from the high school was that the rigor drastically decreased in the remote learning model. And that was because the state had basically told us that we sort of had to do that. We couldn't hold the kids to, you know, as high a standard as we would in, in a normal world. Um, that's been lifted. And so now it's our responsibility to really um, raise those expectations for the kids and give them the clear expectations. I think in the Zoom model, at least there is that face-to-face, -face, but I think also providing additional resources for the students to, um, be challenged will be really important. So I know that doesn't answer your question in its entirety, but I do think that we're making a concerted effort to really streamline the curriculum so that there are clear expectations and we can hold those kids to the standards of AP and honors level and obviously CP level classes. And is there still going to be something similar to the freshman seminar that they were supposed to have? Yes, and I, and I do believe that that will be even more important this year. We've actually tried to build in sophomore, junior, and senior seminars as well, um, not to the same capacity, not every day, but at least once a week, because I think that maintaining that connection with somebody outside of guidance, deans, counseling, staff is going to be exceptionally important, and it's also going to allow us to really focus on the four-year experience and planning for after high school, starting from the moment that they walk into high school, which is always always the goal once they get to that level, um, but it's going to be more challenging when we can't see them face to face. So yes, that will be built in and we'll have groups that will be running. We'll be doing an orient orientation on August 26th, so that will be a good start to that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Stephanie. Lindsay Halverson. Lindsay, are you uh, there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm not allowed to take my mask off. So. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to give a shout out. I have two elementary school kids. The teachers did an amazing job kind of coming up with the curriculum overnight in the spring. Um, at, I obviously work in medicine. I had over 40 COVID positive patients at one point. And as that was happening, it became very hard to log in for certain Zoom times and anything scheduled was a problem actually. <laughs> um, it sounds like that you guys have sort of worked on that a little bit. Um, but I did hear at the last meeting that Dr. Lebo had said there might be a state remote program that was gonna be offered that um, might even be better for not having to log in at certain times, which didn't work for my family. And I was wondering if you had found out the vendor for that or any more about that program. Yeah, I could ask Monty Hitchler to weigh, is he still with us, Jody, by any chance, Monty, or? I mean, but the, um, I think, Lindsay, the answer to your question was, we were a little disappointed in what the state came up with for their learning management system. Uh, it was reviewed and 
uh, was considered that the present platforms we have and that the uh, possibility that the remote piece can still be done with our own educators, with our own curriculum is the most important and that that is going to be available that the, the state model left yes. them to be desired unfortunately they came up with two vendors and uh of which excited us once they finally presented them uh i i believe on the desi website you could probably find those but uh, the problem is they're not uh, with our teachers um and that they were tied to the curriculum but they were pretty substandard in terms of what we had sort of been promised that the state would provide. So um, you mean that they don't reach the, the educational standards or what do you mean that they're substandard? Well, I think that they're tied to the standard, but that the, I'm not sure Jody, if you had a chance to talk to Monty directly about that. Um, I'm here. All right, Monty, can you tell us what, uh, because you went to the workshop, yeah, the state ran these four companies through 36 hours total of testing. And their advice to us was, if you like this model, please test it yourself before you buy it. Um, model option four was that you would replace the teachers with their private um, teachers. They would hire the teachers. The kids would go to that system. Option five was that you would have a curriculum based system um, for about $200 a kid. Um, it, it's quite expensive. Um, it would be, as someone mentioned earlier tonight, layering out, layering on top a completely new system um, that the teachers haven't seen, the curriculum coordinators haven't seen, and how we would implement that with all the other tools we have would be really learning on the fly. Um, so I think we have a lot of the systems in place that are required. I think we know how to use them better. I think we've added a few new systems that can fill in some gaps. And I think for the most part, we're pretty ready to go. Um, I thought it was going to be offered in addition to the Rockport. Are you saying it's no longer offered? Um, I'll jump in here from a curriculum standpoint. Um, the curriculum coordinators were just given the opportunity to start looking at this curriculum that's being provided. So we can't answer a lot of your questions, but the curriculum will not be aligned to the Rockport curriculum. So if you were looking to be able to jump back and forth between this and coming back to school, what was covered and what ordered probably wouldn't be the same, but we'll be reviewing that and seeing what comes next. And then the other pieces, we have highly qualified teachers ready to teach your children um, remotely in ah. that way. So you know, having this paid program replace a teacher is kind of at a state level um, an issue with teachers at the moment. Ah, so the teachers then. Because the, the problem with your plan is that there's still specific times that people need to sign in. And that doesn't work for everyone. So that's why this other state program seemed like it might be a good option. Right. But and we'll, I think we'll know more within a week or so about that once all of our curriculum coordinators in every building at every content level has a chance to actually look at it. But I, I was on a statewide meeting today. And from a teacher perspective, it's, it's looking to replace your um, teacher contact in Rockport as is. Sure. Right. We'll know more. Yeah. yeah. And, and those systems would have schedules too. Um, I thought, okay, I had been explained that they were sort of asynchronous across the board. That, you know, there would be things assigned, but you do it on your, your schedule. They can do both. I mean, yeah. at that time, Lindsay, they had some theories, but they hadn't selected their vendors. And what they did was come up with those two vendors. And when they finally got down, they didn't have some of those promises about you could do it at any time you wanted it was no this is how it's going to be delivered and you would pretty much as Jody said you you would find yourself once you were in it you would probably be in it for the entire year which wouldn't necessarily be a disaster but you, you your ability to just change because of the pacing and how things were taught to jump back in once you would commit it to that that would probably be your model for the entire year. So I don't think it's off the table, you know, completely yet. But at the time we were, we were listening to promises about, well, we're gonna give you a system. 
this is what you can provide to uh, all your folks that are in your situation. And that's not what, what was delivered to us. And asynchronous being no different than a teacher recording a lesson and the, t the kids can access it whenever that we're right. also that, trying like, to create. I like that you guys made that um, change. That is really helpful. Thank you. I think you're doing an amazing job. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So Thank you. Your mask with your yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Carly Donato, you've been waiting for a while now. How is your moment in the sun? Hi, can you hear me? Oh, uh, you're not. Are you Charlie? No, I'm Charlie's mom, Adrian. Thank you. Okay. So I have, I have a couple um, concerns, comments, um, and statements. I guess I'm curious why the school system, the school committee has chosen the most restrictive way of learning versus the least restrictive. So what I mean by that is Rockport has had maybe one or two COVID cases in the past five weeks. We've had multiple tourists coming in, parents, teachers, everybody is at risk. They go to the grocery store. They, you know, everybody is out doing their errands. Some people are maybe going to the restaurant. So everybody is, is at risk. But Rockport, um, you know, we're a small community and it seems like this is the best time to go either in person or hybrid because there are so many, there aren't any cases. You can do outdoor classrooms right now. It just seems um, it's a little bit reversed where you wanna go remote, which is so restrictive and then go to hybrid in the fall or into the winter, which it just doesn't make sense. So go, if I can just I know you have a go. couple of questions, but just to be super literal, this yes. is the first time that the school committee has heard the recommendation from the 29 person advisory committee that was assembled for this. So technically we haven't chosen anything. We're letting the public comment on it. We're meeting tomorrow night to assess the public comments in light of the plan. And then on Monday, if we feel comfortable with what we've discussed, we'd move to a vote. So I know that that's probably sounds like a technicality to you, but I just wanted to make that um, distinction. And I appreciate that. I feel like a lot of the calls coming in were everybody was assuming that it was automatically going to be remote. So I do appreciate that. Um, I guess the other thing that I want to say is, you know, in terms of the three foot, the six foot distancing, I'm um, pretty sure the CDC said if you cannot socially distance, you have to wear a mask. So a desk that's three feet away from another desk, as long as those kids are masked up, to me, I think that's okay. And if, and if nobody, if a parent doesn't feel safe sending their kid, you know, to school because they're three feet away and, and they can't socially distance without a mask, it, it just, I feel like it's, okay as long as the teachers and the students are masked up three feet six feet i'm okay with that Re and, and remote learning for my family means the possibility of me having to quit my job so i can ensure that my kids are attending school as they need as they need to be we, we hear you, we're here to listen to you. I, I just wanna point out that Lindsay, who is calling from her hospital related job, was shaking I know. It so emphatically during that. Um, so I guess I would just say, we've heard you, but we're also gonna be listening and talking with the Board of Health to get a, a full take on that perspective as well. So I don't want you to feel like you haven't been heard, but um, I'm watching someone who's fully suited up and in a hospital setting saying, no, 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 no. So um, I don't want to debate. I work in I say that's what we're trying to balance with the different perspectives. So I understand healthcare too. 
I said, I'm, I am, I'm a frontline worker as well as Lindsay is. So okay. I just want you to know that I'm not, I mean, okay. I understand fully. Gotcha. I mean, one of the things we do have to consider is that remember about a third of our student body are not Rockport residents. They come from Gloucester and Gloucester's case level is slightly different than ours, but they, it still needs to be understood that we're the, that we're really a regional kind of operation. Plus, our our teachers, many of them don't live in Rockport, so they are in communities in many cases where they travel, where there's a much different level. And if they could be asymptomatic, then they could easily bring the virus into the school system. So, I mean, we we hear exactly your concerns. That there are things we've wrestled with and lost sleep over, and um, we had truly hoped to be able to do a hybrid, but with the uptick in the cases, with the concern expressed uh, massively in the folks that have to work directly with the kids about the, their safety, as well as the safety of the kids, it led us to the conclusion that the most prudent approach was to start in a remote and to shift away from what our hybrid was. So. For right or wrong, we can't really tell what that would be like until we can look in our rearview mirror a little further on down. But I can assure you that our goal is to get kids back face to face where they should be with their teachers just as soon as we can possibly do it in a safe way. I understand. I don't agree with it, but I understand. Thank you. And I respect your opinion. I really do. Thank you. Um, Melinda Lima. Melinda, are you there? Melinda is unmuted. Uh, it does look like uh, they're calling in though, so I don't know if their phone's working correctly. They may need to unmute on their end. Yep, I'm here now, sorry. Go ahead, Can Melinda. you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone, for all the hard work that you guys have been doing. I We truly appreciate it. I have um, a son who's going to be starting eighth grade. Um, we were hoping that we were going to be at least going into a hybrid model, and I understand that it's not completely finalized yet. Um, but also, I just wanted to, sorry, I'm just trying to get back to my Zoom meeting. I was unmuting my phone there. Um, I had texted um, in on the chat at the very beginning asking um, about some of the things that were already have been mentioned about, you know, Rockport being in this new map of, of, you know, being in a white area and Gloucester being in a green area, understanding that, you know, we do um, have students coming in from Gloucester as well. Um, I understand that I was told based on the survey that was done that a lot of parents really wanted to um, be more cautious and not really go into school right away um, is what I was told on that response back on the chat. So I understand that. Um, and listening to this almost three hour call right now, again, thank you for everyone and their time. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring up a couple things, ask a few questions um, in regards to everything. Um, one being Again, I, we were, my husband and I kind of were hoping for at least a hybrid. Um, I understand there's, you know, the concern about the HVAC system and the building and air quality. To that point, and that being an item that would probably, you know, extend the, the timing at October 14th or November 25th, do we have a date already, an appointment set up with facilities or with HVAC representatives in regards to when this inspection will, is going to be happening or what our units are, um, are in need of? Yeah, I would uh, ask Kirk to weigh in, who I see right below me on the diagonal. So Kirk, can you fill them in on the status of ventilation? Yes, so as of next week, we have an air quality control company coming in to do an assessment on our system and to do a air quality test to see 
where we stand right now and what we need to bring it up to the standards for the COVID. So as of right now, they're at, in Pentucket schools and they'll be in the Rockwood school systems as of next week. Okay, thank you. Do, um, I, I work for a HVAC representative um, and I know lead times on, you know, certain units, you know, can take six to eight weeks and costs on that, on these um, units are very expensive. Um, you know, it, it kind of scares me in regards to, you know, that the remote could be extended definitely past 1014, you know, to maybe even past November. In regards to a remote being long term, and in regards to parents' concerns, even teachers' concerns about screen time being for so, you know, a lot of screen time for the kids. Are we able to get textbooks for the students to bring home so they actually have a physical book to look at? Um, or somehow, I, I understand that there's a lot of the books are everything's like online and whatnot, but is there a way to somehow get hard copies, um, you know, especially to, you know, those families that might not have printers at home, um, you know, that aspect as well? Hello. So, <laughs> so what's my question? So there's so stunned, I, I'm, stunned silence here as we're processing the question. So no, I understand. books being sent home, does anyone have a feel for that? I mean, I, I, I feel like there isn't enough books. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I grew up in school, very large classes. We all had textbooks. Coming here to Rockport, the classrooms are small. You know, e you know, each class is say 60 to 80 kids or whatnot. I was very surprised that there's not a textbook for every child. You know, kids are sharing Spanish books and whatnot. Are we, if we're unable to get a book for everyone, are we able to get hard copies, you know, of, of papers for the families, especially those families that, you know, can't, I can print things at home, but there might be families out there that can't. Okay. So I think, I mean, I mean, based on there being no answer, I guess we have to go back and validate, are there, there are not books or paper materials available? Michael, we, I could answer, I could answer. Yeah. I, still okay, thank you. I was just on mute, sorry, I was on mute. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were all on mute, except for Rob. Um, yeah, I, I think from the high school perspective, we would plan to still give out textbooks and hard copy materials wherever we could. I mean, specifically like in AP classes and things like that, we certainly do have textbooks, which every student has. There are certain um, subject areas that write their own curriculum, such as math, so we don't always use textbooks, but but the majority of our subjects do. And so we would we would be, we purchase them just as we have every other year. We rebuild the supplies just as we have every other year. So um, the thought would be that we would utilize them at the high school level. And that's the same oh. for the school. If we okay, had textbooks was... or books that kids would have access to in school, we would make those available for families if they needed them. All right. I think that would be great, um, especially for all, you know, for all families, um, potentially. Um, in regard to the school supplies, if families had ordered school supplies, and since we're going to be most likely going to be going um, remote, those families that ordered school supplies, can we set up some sort of time to pick up those supplies that were ordered so the kids can kind of create whatever space in their room? Um, Absolutely. To, you know, I think that would be helpful. Um, a question in regards to when we go hybrid, um, with the kids, um, again, I have a, someone still in middle school, but I'm sure other parents on the calls for all three schools. Will the kids um, kind of be staying in one classroom and just having the teachers be the ones that are circulating through the halls? Or is the plan to still um, have, you know, kids just circulate through their classrooms as usual? Or is perhaps maybe that's something to think about or consider, I'm not sure. 
Um, yeah, we've, we've been considering that and we had a plan. Um, so we adjusted our scheduling so that the students would be moving to classrooms. However, we um, are looking at how the building is set up and what like the transitions would look like. So it would be very minimal student transitioning, kind of moving some of our transition times between grade levels um, so that it would be safe in between classes. Thank you, Mrs. Castingway. And then in regard to the three versus, you know, six feet, it sounds like Rockport does want to stay with the six foot distance. Um, are there enough classrooms for all the students if we were to go full time um, to have a six foot distance between desks or will the, is that one of the reasons why the hybrid and having the cohort, uh, you know, different groups spreading out within the week um, is happening? Yeah, we would not have enough classrooms if we were to be in full mode, um, you know, at a time when there still was concerns about the virus and maintain six feet. That was the result of what they called the pressure testing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Initially forced the, well, then it would need to be a hybrid. And that's where we were three or four weeks ago was at the hybrid level. But it, it basically took a full opening off of the table until there was a suitable vaccine in place and the virus wasn't an issue for us. You, you, we would not have enough space. And, and we certainly would be able to maintain the kind of distances that would be required in the hallway. You would have uh, you know, 300 kids at the high school and when the bell goes off, they're all in the hallways and there's no way you can maintain that kind of distance. It, it, it's hard enough to do the tr transitions when you do the hybrid with half the number of kids in the building and still maintain that kind of separation that you need. But I, I don't know of a, well, maybe one school system that's fairly close to us was still considering a, a three foot, but almost every other district in, in the North shore completely rejected the six, um, the three foot claim that that was a safe distance with masks. Okay. Um. I think those are just the comments and questions that I um, had written down. Again, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Melinda. Mary Beth Murphy, you're up next. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep, we can see you too. Oh dear, I'll turn my video off. Um, so not a comment, just, I mean, not a question, but just a comment. Um, I am on the Board of Health in Rockport, and there was an earlier question about, you know, what happens if, if somebody um, comes down with the virus, either somebody in the school or a parent in the school. And I just wanted to quickly let folks know that in Rockport, we have two public health nurses that um, from the beginning of the pandemic have been handling our tracking and tracing. Um, they have been able to keep up with all of our cases and have done so independently. Um, and they have all sorts of protocols and they're working closely with our school nurses and we'll continue that relationship um, as we go forward into the hybrid model. Um, additionally, the Department of Public Health has given all communities who need additional support with tra tracking and tracing if, if needed. Um, so far, Rockport hasn't needed any of that, but I just wanted to sort of let people know that Rockport has a robust system um, for dealing with COVID cases uh, for when we do go into um, a hybrid model. Um, and we've been doing it for some time and doing it well. That's all. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for waiting so long, too. You're on there for quite a while. Um, Gail Bob. You are next. Gail, Bob, are you there? I'm assuming you're twins. <laughs> they are unmuted, um, so they may be having an issue um, from their end. Okay. Oh, there they go. No, they keep going back and forth. Okay. 
Doesn't look like we're going to be able to hear them. Hmm. Gail Bobby there. I waited for a while. Um, we'll just text them so they just wait. All right, well, why don't we move on to H, Stacy? We'll come back to Gail Bob if they're able to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Harmony Stacy. I have three kids in Rockport, and I also teach high school in another district nearby. Um, and so first, I just wanted to say that I know there's been a little bit of um, sort of negativity regarding the spring remote learning. My three kids had fantastic experiences. Um, the teachers were great. The curriculum was great. They did the best they could. This was emergency crisis remote learning with, you know, zero um, training or knowledge of it ahead of time. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for that and also say that I'm incredibly impressed with the honesty and transparency that Rob is putting forth to everyone tonight in terms of the logistics and um, the way that educators might be feeling in addition to the way parents and kids are feeling. Massachusetts was incredibly slow to reopen everything. Baker was incredibly measured. And I think that um, that is probably the most appropriate way to open schools. Um, so I'm voicing my support for this plan. Um, I'm relieved to hear that this is the recommendation. Um, kids have been mostly sheltered since March. We have seen what's happened in the last month in other parts of the country. And we are seeing all of these stories and studies coming out now as well about aerosol droplets and the HVAC systems and how important those are. Um, my question is the October 14th and November 24th or 25th date, would those be the day if it is, um, if we are allowed to move to hybrid on those dates, would those be the exact dates the kids would start back in school or that's the date the evaluation sort of begins? My view of that is that that would be when the kids would begin and that there'd be work leading up to that date. But because of sort of the, the timing of how those work, the one in November as an example is just before the Thanksgiving break, I believe, so that the kids would then return on that following Monday to a hybrid model. Uh, the Columbus Day weekend one, I think, is set up sort of the same way. I think it's a Wednesday, but that's because there's, a, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but I think there's a professional day right there. So th that we would have had those discussions about, you know, what are the metrics, where are we at? Are, are the building safety things all taken care of? Are the, the educators that have to come into the building, are, are they now comfortable coming into that space that that would be the turnkey moment and it wouldn't be okay on the 14th we're now going to look at those metrics that would have happened starting now basically in terms of you know what what exactly are those are discussions with the board of health about those that we get a clear uh, picture of what are those are going to be so i see those as the turnkey perfect thank you so much and thank you for everything you've done leading up to this oh you're welcome it's, it's uh, Rob, we have um, a question that was texted to me about the um, air HVAC system. And the question is, why are we just testing this now? And I think you probably have a better sense of the timeline of when this became an issue that was identified as an issue. Uh, we're testing it now because of the, obviously the concern about the number of air exchanges necessary to deal with the virus. Um, the the heating and ventilation system for the school itself. I've, I've been here for eight years and that was on the, the list of major building capital outlay projects for the town. They did an entire building study of all town buildings. But, but wait, I, I think the, the question is actually, when did we realize we needed to test that exchange? 
and when did we start that process? So I think the person asked right. the that was a, yeah. a concern probably three or four weeks ago in terms of being able to certify that. Uh, we had talked to our previous uh, uh, maintenance people who said, no, those, those unit ventilators do the proper amount. They're, they're serviced annually. Uh, they're maintained. Uh, the belts are replaced. But the actual testing for the number of air exchanges became an issue that arose uh, sort of statewide. And then we put it on our radar. So maybe three or four weeks max, but we had to line up some folks. We had Guardian lined up for a little while. And I don't know, Kirk, if you can talk about why Guardian wasn't the uh, wasn't the ideal um, agency to deal with that. So that's not Guardian's specialty, as far as checking for air quality control. That's why we had to look for another company. Right. And that's why we I reached out to Barb McCarthy on the Board of Health, who works for the hospitals, and she talked to their facilities manager, who put me in touch with. The company that's coming in next week. Okay, thank you. I think that answers it. All right, so we have, um, looks like we only have two questions in queue. One is from Parent. Hi, Parent and hi. So on the HVAC system, do we already know that it's not sufficient? No, I don't think we know that. We, 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 what we have to do is look at the guidance and there's some conflicting guidance with regard to what the number of air exchanges are necessary per uh, the, the square footage and per hour in the different spaces. And, you know, some of those have just come to light. But um, no, it's not that we don't think it will work. I mean, it's an, it's an aging system. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to find that it's that it's up to compliance in 80% of the spaces, and then this unit ventilator needs to be replaced, which we will then do. Or if there's a roof, a, a roof ventilator that needs to be replaced, we will do that as well. I think that's a that's a fairly quick process once th those spaces are identified. But it isn't as if you know the entire system is a failed system. It's a it's a difficult building to obviously, uh, you know, feel comfortable in a lot of the time because of the regulation, mostly of the heating. Sometimes they're either too cold or too warm, but the actual air exchange, I'm not sure is the, you know, the same kind of problem that we have with the heat in the winter. We do have the problem of, you know, on days like this, if you were on the second floor of the high school, no matter how many air exchanges you had, you would say this air quality is horrible because it's humid and 90 degrees in those classrooms with a, you know, black roof just above your head, uh, you know, beating down on, on those classrooms with no air conditioning or any kind of, you know, you know, situation. But that may be that the number of air exchanges are happening properly in that space. It's just you're pulling in 90 degree humid air and running that into a already tight space. And no matter who's in there is going to feel like the air exchange is terrible, but those companies will say, nope, it is making the number of air exchanges that it needs to. All right, and I, you would already answer the fact that basically the full in-person model is really not on the table. And what would it take to go from hybrid to in-person? A vaccine or? I what? think what it takes is a vaccine, to be honest with you. It's the only way that I see us being able to get back to that kind of normal school situation. And I, I hate to say that, but I, I think that's reality then, and, and that's everywhere that you're not gonna be able to pull off a full in-person model until that's there. That's a okay. tough pill to swallow, but I don't think there's any other answer to that. And um, I know of no school system that is going back that I know of going back fully in person. In, in, someone in, just posted, yeah. I mean, it could be false, but someone just posted Middleton was, but you know, this is all people talking. Yeah, and I, all I can say is everything I've looked at, uh, to me, that would not be a, a prudent, safe decision to, to make with the responsibility that we carry. And who is going to make this final ultimate decision based on these meetings? 
Well, I mean, I think the school committee is charged with that um, based on a superintendent's recommendation. And right now the superintendent's recommendation is, is what we read earlier. And it was supported by the 29 member uh, committee, uh, 28 to one to pass the plan forward. But the school committee is still, you know, going to listen to all the feedback from tonight. They have another phase tomorrow night. Uh, they don't take their vote tomorrow night. They take it Monday night. And um, it's not the superintendent who can just say, this is what's going to happen. Uh, because the school committee are your representatives. They're elected to take on that decision. And the, the Department of Education wants all, all school committees to approve the plans. For a while, earlier in the summer, there was a sort of myth out there, no, superintendent makes a decision. That's the way it is. And you just live with it. But we've gotten guidance that says, no, you're going to get it approved by your school committee, approved by your superintendent, and then you're going to submit it to us with some possibilities that they might send it back to us. But uh, I think that's more for not having covered some aspect of, of safety or not filling out their plan properly, rather than saying, no, don't hand us a remote plan. I think it now they will take any plan of those three models and they just expect you to back that up and have, have answers to their concerns about safety and that kind of thing. There was so one it won't point. be that they decide, okay, we want to do a hybrid. So that's not no. even. I mean, there was one point, to be honest with you, at the end of June, where the commissioner said to all the superintendents that we are going to hand you 95% of what you have to do in the fall. That you're only going to have control over 5% of it. We're going to tell you the model. We don't want one community doing one thing next to each other and then one community out doing the other or, you know, getting out of the gate or lagging behind because it's not good that Gloucester does one thing and Rockport does another and Manchester does something else. That went out the window two weeks later to this is a local decision. It's going to be left to the locals to decide all this. And I think that's probably wise. I mean, we're the ones that have to have to live through this with this decision. We have an excellent board of health. We, we've had their partnership on these meetings. Uh, there's been some disagreement. I'm sure there's some disagreement on, on which direction we're going in, but we've had expert advice and help from all directions. We worked with our, our teachers association closely on every decision right from the beginning where a lot of places just sort of dismissed that. And that's not an excuse or trying to you know, say anything different, but I think we've all come to the conclusion that what we're doing is right now in our best interest with the goal to as quickly as possible transition to a hybrid. Okay. Rob, I, I wanna add one thing for, for this um, questioner and that is it would be really easy for the school committee to say, well, it's the superintendent's decision. We just have the, the ability to override it. It would be really easy for the superintendent to say, well, the school committee didn't like it. They could override me. It would be really easy for both of us to say, well, it's about the teachers union or it's about the board of health. But from a very early start, it's been a very collaborative process between all of these groups acting like grown adults to try and make a very difficult decision. So, you know, in the fullness of time, we may find that we were conservative by one month or two months or three months, but compared to the alternative, the consensus of the committee who's presented this tonight is this is the safest possible course. So that's part of what we're going to be looking at tomorrow night and then on Monday night for the approval. You know, the, there is no one right answer that's clearly um, provable. So thus you have to go on expert testimony and our best thinking in terms of getting there. So I really appreciate all the work that everybody's put in to act in a very adult manner to come up with a consensus decision. So that's, that's a big thank you. And hopefully that, that helps a little bit with the person who's asking the question that there's no buck passing here. It's a consensus of people trying to make a difficult decision. Brenda Wood, you're up next. Hi, Wait. sorry, I, I, my screaming child is now in bed so I can complete my thought from a couple hours ago. Um, so I have an elementary student going into second grade 
And I have a bunch of concerns. I too was hoping for hybrid. And I'm wondering if there was any consideration of the plan that Salem had put out there to have K through three in person um, and then some kind of hybrid or remote for the other grades. Uh, scheduling committee members want to weigh in on that at all? Specifically? Yeah, there, there was really, there was really no consideration given to a partial group coming into the building, I think out of the gate. Um, in terms of uh, at the elementary level for, for planning purposes. Um, but. No, it's just, it's, I don't have experience with the older age groups, but obviously it's like, I know my child and we have a younger sibling in the house and remote learning and talking to people online. It's, it's like they're, they're abstractly there. It's, it's not, it's a different mindset than the older kids. Not that the older kids don't have their own set of challenges. I totally respect those challenges as well. Um, but I'm just the one, the level of involvement from the parents for the elementary level if we're talking about four hours a day five days a week of remote learning for a seven-year-old that's going to have to be facilitated by a parent in the home which is a challenge for working parents so i know that daycare is not the issue but it's, it's the quality of the education i am not a teacher so the delivery is this isn't coming out right because it's 10 30 at night but I, I think you get what I'm saying that uh, is, I'm just concerned overall with that particular age group, the level of education they're going to receive, the level of involvement that the parents will have to commit to conflicting with other children in the home and full-time jobs and everything else. Yes. No, I, 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 as a parent of twin second graders in the same situation, um, it, it's not ideal. And I think certainly as we move forward here, um, you know that, that a primary consideration has to be getting you know our youngest kids in as quickly as we can um and maybe that means there's a variation of of the you know remote learning and hybrid across the district i don't know but um i, I agree it's a it's a huge challenge to do remote Will there be any opportunity particularly for these other like younger age groups to maybe meet their teacher in some socially appropriate distancing appropriate setting so it's an actual person and not just a, a face on the other end of a screen yep, that's yeah we've, that's we've definitely talked about that brenda doing that yeah, and we, uh, you know trying to find a safe way to do that because that's that's an important part we haven't flushed that out completely uh but i think that is on the table to talk about in some way and the other thing is i've just been been told that salem today moved into the the red metric and that they have just or at least on facebook that's being put out that that salem has just moved to a full remote for the entire district uh, yes yeah, so, i mean i would if they're in the red district that completely makes sense it was just i thought it was an interesting option when i had heard that they were looking at that and especially just we struggled we struggled at the end of last year with a first grader, even though she had an excellent teacher and an excellent relationship with that teacher. Towards the end of the year, come, come mid-June, she was checked out. So I'm just really concerned about the engagement level and the level of education that they are actually gonna receive at this remote, full remote level. As I'm sure everybody else is, you know, every age group has a challenge, but yeah. I'm envisioning myself sitting there for four hours a day, five days a week, while I also work eight to nine hours a day, five days a week. So just voicing the challenge, I know this is our forum to do so. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> there was a question before we go to Melinda. There was a question saying, I appreciate the plan, appreciate the candor. Please mention how you plan to test the students, teachers, and staff for the virus and deal with the delay in getting results of the tests. So I'm not sure exactly if we have that plan completely fleshed out for when we go back into the school, Rob, or is... Uh, there, there has not been discussion about uh, wide uh, testing of, of, of students and, and parents, I mean, excuse me, and, uh, and teachers. Um, Mary Beth, I don't know if you can sort of allude to the ease or difficulty of that? 
possibly from the Board of Health perspective? Sorry, let me just find her to unmute her real quick. I don't want to put Mary Beth on the spot. But Hello? I think Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, testing has been a challenge um, throughout. Currently in Cape Ann, there's only one testing site that you can go to and that's the urgent care. Um, it's something that both the selectmen and the Board of Health has been trying to work on, but as you can imagine, um, testing is hard to come by. Um, so it's not something that um, the hospital um, or the Board of Health has been particularly, um, ha we haven't made much headway in getting more testing to Cape Ann. Um, so the idea that, I did hear that Charlie Baker was going to try to do some rapid testing for schools, but nothing has come out so far. So right now, I don't believe that there's any plan for, the, for Rockport, um, the hospitals, or the state to do any testing in schools. Right. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes, thank you for that. Sorry, I was wrestling with my mute button. Okay, yeah. so Melinda, you're up next. You are our last question, unless someone wants to slip in behind okay. Melinda and ask one. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Just uh, a follow up in regards to Mr. Lebo's comment in regards to the vaccine. So I just want to make sure I understand. So for a full, full time in school, most likely will not happen until there is a vaccine. Is that correct? Uh, that's my personal and professional opinion that there's, there's no way you could pull off a complete full return to school in a safe way without a vaccine being present or some different remarkable treatment that comes forward, which doesn't seem like that's a prospect. Okay, and then um, assuming that within the next week or week and a half or so, a uh, week or two, whatever, um, the school committee and yourself and the 29 people panel will come up with the um, points in regards to what is needed to go to that hybrid aspect of school. I can't guarantee to be a week or week and a half, but we will certainly flush that out, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. And we'll, we'll do it in co consultation with our Board of Health folks. You know, again, the metrics just were put on the table yesterday and the Board of Health has already sort of batted it back and forth uh, between members as to, well, what does that mean in a community of our size? You know, is that a clean metric to just use a per hundred thousand? number, which may be fine in communities with, you know, 100,000 people, but not necessarily in Rockport. So I think we need to listen to some of our experts um, in the medical field, probably tomorrow night, about what does that metric mean? Because it's, the, the ink is still wet on that. It really is. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Melinda. Okay, well, is there anyone else? We still have 146 people on the line. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question before we conclude this forum? I see no hands. So thank you everybody for attending. We'll be meeting tomorrow night um, in a regular school committee meeting the school committee itself will be talking about what it's heard tonight and the parent, um, the parent um, comments will be included in that discussion. If there's a question you have that you didn't think to ask tonight, you can certainly come and ask it then and then we'll move on to the Monday meeting where we'll make a decision uh, and consider an endorsement prior to sending the materials to DESE. So thank you all for coming tonight, everybody. Thank you, especially teachers who have been hanging in there. Um, and we'll see some of you tomorrow night.